Thank you very much. After Glasgow University, uh, as a senior researcher, he came back to India and joined IIT uh, Bombay uh, in, in the year of 2009 as an assistant professor in Department of Electrical Engineering. After that, he promoted to associate professor, uh, professor in the year of 2014 in the same department. And then he became professor from 2014 uh, in the same uh, institute, same department. His research interest is 3-5 compound semiconductor material growth and characterizations of electronic devices of uh, interest, including quantum dot photodetector and solar cells, 3-5 device integrations on germanium. So he has been awarded as a Nashi Reliance Industries Platinum Jubilee Award in 2016 from Nashi Council. So he has published more than 100 journal papers in re different reputed journals. He also edited some books, two or three books, and he has published the conference papers more than 106. So with this short introduction, I will invite to Professor Chakraborty for his technical lecture, sir. Well, thank you, Dr. Professor Mondul, for the introduction. So I think it's still pretty early morning out in Durgapur and other places. That's that's fine. So I have, uh, if you have seen, I have changed the title a bit. And uh, this MBE growth of quantum confined heterostructures and devices, a journey from investigating investigation of varying quantum dot heterostructure and devices to ultimate demonstration of thermal imaging focal plane arrays. So uh, as was mentioned by Professor Mondol, we focus mainly on compound semiconductor materials and more importantly, uh, three five semiconductors. And uh, our focus mainly is to demonstrate technology. And the technology of concern that we mainly focus on is thermal imaging sensor array, which we call the focal plane arrays. So this is the first, uh, this was the first demonstration in the country of quantum dot based focal plane arrays, which could image human signature. Uh, and this was uh, based on uh, a 320 by 256 focal plane array. But this journey, this journey, that during this journey, a lot of things happened. A lot of studies had to be carried out. And uh, that's a part of the talk would be on that, that how we optimized our samples, got the different results, which culminated in the demonstration of this technology. So I was presuming, and I hope there are some students in this uh, audience. So I'll introduce molecular beam epitaxy in short, and then discuss on some of the coupled and uncoupled heterostructures, come to various devices, quantum dot based infrared detectors and uh, uh, then we'll come to the focal plane array which is our main focus and you know one thing is optimizing materials optimizing single pixel devices but since we have demonstrated the focal plane arrays which we call FPA we also wanted to check the impact of various xc2 and inc2 factors on the performance of quantum dot focal plane arrays. So I'll, if time permits, I'll show you some of the results. And MB is a, you know, molecular beam epitaxy is used for producing high quality layers, which are very important for device applications with very good control of thickness, doping and composition. This is very important. And you can basically grow some, some and strong per second or some uh, sub and strong thickness layers. And because of the high degree of control possible, it is a valuable tool in the development of sophisticated electronic and optoelectronic devices. So basically a simple MBE consists of a load lock chamber into which you load wafers and from here again you take out the grown wafers. After load lock comes the transfer or the buffer chamber and finally you have the growth chamber. But each is isolated from the other so as to maintain the cleanliness of each individual chamber. 
Now, if you look at this, is a particular layout of a Vico mod Gen 2 molecular beam epitaxy system. This is the intro chamber, and you have heating elements. So you take the get the wafers inside this chamber. You heat the wafer to remove water vapor and moisture, and there is a gate valve. So whatever is happening in the intro chamber is not impacting the buffer or the intermediate chamber. So you remove the water vapor, then you open this gate valve, and it transfers this wafer to the buffer or the intermediate chamber here. Then you do. You also have a heating station. So you put the wafers here to heat it up to a higher temperature, say 400, 450, to remove organic impurities. And finally, once these are heated, then you use this transfer rod to transfer this clean wafer to the growth chamber. In the growth chamber, you have the growth manipulator or the substrate manipulator, as you see here. And you have the flux measure for the flux measurement. You have the iron gauge. And these are the different diffusion cells which hold the various sources like gallium, indium, arsenic, aluminium, and so on. OK, so this is how a typical. Uh, so you load the substrate onto the manipulator. Then you rotate it by 180 degrees so that the wafer faces the sources. That is the gallium, indium, aluminium, dopants. Also, you have dopants sources. And depending on the temperature, uh, the growth rate of each, each individual element will vary. And you finally grow it. Okay. So if you look at the growth chamber in details, uh, the effusion cells are there, having you know depending on what material you are growing. For our case, it's gallium, indium, aluminium. Uh, arsenic, and then you have the dope and silicon and beryllium. And as I was mentioning, there is the iron gauge to measure the flux and also the pressure in the chamber. You can measure that. Now, in order to ensure uniformity, this substrate not only rotates in the XY plane, but if there is also a azimuthal rotating assembly, so that you get a very uniform growth uh, onto the wafer substrate rather. And one of the most important part of the MB is what is called the, <coughs> the REAP system, the reflection high energy electron beam diffraction system. So you have electron beam coming here, and the reflection, the diffracted pattern that you see on the screen, that gives you an idea of the quality of the growth that you are doing, whether it is 2D layer by layer, whether it is 3D, whether your surface is good or your surface is rough, you get a lot of idea. And that's why MB is very important for new material development. And these are the various steps. Probably many of you know about it. So the molecular beam comes in. Initially, there is adsorption. And then it moves towards the edge to create the layers. And some of these are already incorporated. There is incorporation. And there is also a possibility of desorption. OK, so like, uh, you know, in our case, arsenic has a very high vapor pressure. So there is a high possibility of arsenic desorption. So in case of gallium arsenide growth, you maintain a very high arsenic flux on the substrate surface. OK, now for the layers which are completed here, you also have interdiffusion. Like if you have indium arsenide and then you have gallium arsenide, then indium can diffuse here and the gallium can diffuse into that layer. OK, so that's called interdiffusion. So a lot of mechanisms happens, a lot of things happen. And I think your primary target is to optimize the growth conditions so that you get continuous layer by layer growth. OK, and also a smooth surface so that the quality of your interfaces are better. This is the four inch molecular beam epitaxy system that we have at IIT Bombay. And most of the results are from this epinic system that we have here. And uh, coming to infrared detectors, which are our main focus, there are a lot of applications like, as you see here, chemical spectroscopy, medical diagnosis, point sensors, thermal imaging, atmospheric applications, surveillance. And we mainly focus on the thermal imaging part, the night deprivation. And when you are targeting this thermal imaging, there are two important windows that you have. One is the midwave infrared window. This is the transmission in the atmosphere. That is between three to five micron. And then also you have the long wave infrared window. And that's the eight to 14 micron. 
this is the window where you can actually human uh, uh, Im image human signatures and you have the fir window also that is also something that you have but mainly for missile tracking you use the 3 to 5 micron and for uh, human detection you use the 8 to 14 micron now why quantum dot detectors because uh, of course by that time when quantum well technology was established uh, you also have a lot of commercial devices, but the problem is it was you have the fabrication process was very complicated because quantum wells could not absorb normal incident light. And also uh, the temperature of operation, the dark current in quantum well devices are very high. So that's the other problem. So that if you list out the advantages, one is the normal incident operation. The second is the high temperature operation for quantum dot based devices and also the expected high characteristics parameters such as responsibility and detectability. So it's mainly the first two which, which was the motivation for getting into quantum dot based infrared photo detectors. And all this growth that the quantum dot based stuff that I am going to say, uh, speak about here, it's grown, grown by the Stransky cross of mode. So initially you have a 2D layer and then followed uh, after a certain critical thickness you have the 3D island formation. So if you start with the gallium arsenide substrate here, as you see here, then initially you grow some gallium arsenide buffer to have a smooth growth front. Then as you start depositing the wetting layer, uh, sorry, as you start depositing the quantum dot layer, you initially have the wetting layer followed by the quantum dots. Okay, so you have uh, the nanostructure formation. And if you look at the AFM picture here, the typical dot density lies in the 10 to the power 10 per centimeter range. And as I was mentioning when I was explaining the uh, MB that here we have the reach system. So when you are growing the gallium arsenide on gallium arsenide, that is lattice mesh growth, uh, you have very high, uh, high intensity streaky pattern as you see here. Okay. As you start depositing the quantum dot layer, the initial layers are 2D. So it is, it remains tricky, but the, with the reduced intensity. And finally, after a certain critical thickness, you have dot formation, and then the streaky pattern goes through a chevron, and finally it goes spotty. So the spotty pattern indicates the formation of quantum dots in the sample. Also, if you have to notice that the other thing when you see spotty patterns during growth in general, that means your surface is not very smooth. So that's also an indication. But uh, since we are confining our discussion to quantum dot based material, so I would like to insist that here you, from the read, you can say that quantum dot formation has taken place when you see the pattern being spotty. So this is a typical image of quantum dot. And uh, based on if you look at uh, the quantum mechanical part, this is uh, this diagram that you see on the right hand side is basically the indium arsenide gallium arsenide conduction band schematic and from the eight band k dot p calculation you can calculate the ground state the first excited state the second excited state the third excited state and there are also the continuum states okay there are also the continuum states and uh, what you see on the left hand side is a high resolution tem of a single quantum dot and as you can see, it's typically pyramidal. Most of the samples that we have grown are pyramidal. We'll be dealing with a lot of PL, photoluminescence, and we have a setup and more probably it is understood by, is known to many of you, that when it, light is incident on the sample, electrons are excited from the valency band to the conduction band. So you have free electrons and holes. And then when they recombine, they emit light. So this is called photoluminescence and the, the animation that you are going to see is as you see the laser light falls on the samples in the cryostat then you see the reflected light or rather the scattered light and you go, it goes through the lenses filter into the spectrograph and finally depending on the emission thing uh, if it is quantum dot we use in gas detector Okay, and you see the PL spectrum of intensity versus wavelength. Or if it is uh, like if we are talking of uh, UV, then we use a silicon detector. 
and then you also get a similar spectrum. So it all depends which detector, silicon or uh, in gas, indium gallium arsenide, which we choose depending on the material system that you are wanting to characterize. So we have grown indium arsenide, gallium arsenide dot single layers or uncoupled as when I'm talking of uncoupled in that case, that means that uh, the two layers are separated by a large distance. So there is no interaction between the dot layer. In both those cases, what we have noticed is when you do th rapid thermal annealing, initially <clears throat> you have a PLC around 1200 nanometer. Then as you increase go on annealing, there is a lot of interdiffusion and the PL shifts. So on one hand, you have from the PL full width half maximum, you can predict that there is a large inhomogeneity or a broad size distribution. On the other hand, the large blue shifting actually indicates that there is a lot of interdiffusion. Okay, so by chance, if you are putting this material in a in some applications in some devices where uh, uh, where there may be heating, then this material can suffer interdiffusion, and your spectral signature may shift. So in order to uh, explore or in order to get into materials which probably would show higher thermal stability, uh, we people have proposed the what is called the strain coupling. That is, you have two dot layers. First is the seed dot layer and then you have the active dot layer. So the active dot layer is grown in the strain field of the seed dot layer. And the thing is, because of this strain patterning, because of this existing strain coming from the bottom layer, uh, there is some amount of homogeneity that is actually uh, introduced in the sample. And why is this important? Homogeneity that is in, uh, because, uh, because of higher homogeneity, you have a reduced photoluminescence line width. And what you see is the absorption coefficient is inversely proportional to the line width. So when you are looking at applications like, uh, like uh, detectors or in laser, the modal gain is also inversely proportional to the line width. You want to have quantum dots which are very uniform. And so strain patterning is a technique to get that in order to achieve that thing. So what we have done is we have grown various, when you talk of two layers of dot, you got you talk of bilayer strain coupled. When you talk of three layers, such strain coupled, you got tri-layer and so on. So we have grown bilayer, um, various samples with varying amount of quantum dot material. So you have this is the seed layer and this is the uh, act, uh, active layer, the top layer. And we also varied the barrier, that this is the barrier between the quantum dot layer. This is also varied. Now, I'm not getting into the details of the results here, but what I would want to say is the leftmost is the one where you have a single dot layer or an uncoupled dot layer system, and you see huge amount of interdiffusion. So there is a shift in the PLP emission line width. Whereas when you are talking of pi layer, depending on the sample that you are talking of for a 7.5 nanometer, the shift, shift was around 25 nanometer. Whereas if you look at the uncoupled sample, this shift is around 200 to 250 nanometer. Okay, there's a huge shift here. Whereas here in the second graph for a 7.5 nanometer spacer, the shift was around 25 nanometer. And if you look at the 8.5 nanometer sample, then up to a certain temperature, say 700 or so, there is hardly any shift here. There is hardly. So there is a thermal stability which has been introduced by strain coupling in this sample. And beyond that, you see some shift up to 750. And up at 800 or so, there is a complete dissolution of the dots to some extent. But still dots exist with a reduced size, and thereby there is a blue shift. But you know, for most of the applications, I don't think you go to eight, 750 or 800 uh, degree operating temperature. So in a way, strain coupling introduces homogeneity. So from two layer, and you can also see the evidence that the dots are still existing at 700 from the cross-sectional TEM image. You see, so from the cross-sectional TEM, this is the as grown sample. This is the 700 degree. The dots are almost intact. But at 800 degrees Celsius, there is interdiffusion starting in and the dots are getting lighter. And that's why you see the blue shift. So this evidence was. 
this uh, not only from the PL we got um, thermal stability, but also this was validated through cross-sectional T. Now from here we went on to consider 10 layer coupled structure to see how far it improves. Because if you remember here, we could see the thermal stability up to 700 degrees Celsius. Now in case of 10 layer, we have grown 10 layer of varying barriers. As you see here, the samples are mentioned here, varying barriers. The dots are kept the same, 2.7 monolayer. Uh, here also, see up to 750, the dots are almost intact. I'm not going getting into low temperature. It will be intact anyway. From 800, some kind of dissolution starts or interdiffusion starts. At 850, the dots are totally damaged. I mean, it's gone. Okay. So from that same thing, again, this is the reference data of the uncoupled sample where you see a large photoluminescence line with um, uh, which is uh, sorry, photoluminescence PL uh, peak wavelength blue shifting. But here uh, you can see two PL signatures. So these are called bimodal dots. You see two types of dots. If I go back to the TEM, you see the dots at the lower end of the stack is smaller and that at the higher end is larger. So you see two kinds of dot families, which is evident from the PL. This is the larger dot family. This is the smaller dot family. But if you if you follow this uh, sm uh, smaller dot family, it remains almost constant up to 750 degrees Celsius and beyond that the blue shifting starts. Okay, beyond that the blue shifting starts. So what we could see is from the multi-layer coupled strain coupled heterostructure, we could see the thermal stability like we have seen for the bilayer, but the thermal stability improves uh, by more than uh, by about 50 degrees Celsius with slight blue shifting. And what the conclusion of this work is probably the strain coupled heterostructures have better thermal stability compared to uncoupled or single layer quantum dot heterostructure. But as you have seen, I have mentioned about bimodal dot size distribution and if so you are getting two peaks at the ground uh, at, uh, in the as grown sample. So this was not something desired. We wanted dots of a single family of similar size and this is a conventional growth sample where you see smaller dots at the lower half of the lower end of the stack and larger dots at the upper end. Now we have developed a modified growth strategy where as you see here, the dot sizes remains constant over the entire stack. Okay, this is a modified growth strategy. So you have to go through a lot of calibrations and in this case, you can see uh, uh, monomodal size distribution. And this is what is shown in the schematic and also in the PL. You see the red is the conventional coupled qubit where the dot size, there is a dot size variation across the stack. Whereas the black one is the proposed coupled qubit where uh, you see a single, you see a single uh, dot family. Okay. You see a single dot family. So this is what we established. Now coming to the infrared photo detectors, uh, you have this India Marsnet, Gallium Marsnet quantum dots. And what I show here is basically the schematic of the India Marsnet, Gallium Marsnet uh, quantum dot heterostructure. So as I was mentioning, uh, this is of course under bias. So this is the negative and this is the positive end. And you have the different states, the ground state, the excited states here, and then you have the continuum. So carriers, when, inf when infrared light is incident on this heterostructure, carriers are excited from the ground state to the excited state, and they either go out through thermionic emission or through field assisted tunneling, okay, or through field assisted tunneling. And since it is under bias, so as a result, after they come out of the dots, they drift in the electric field and you get the corresponding photo current. So one is the generation of the photo current, and the second part is because there can be multiple transition from the ground state to the first excited, ground state to the second excited, ground state to the continuum. So you also have a multicolored operation. So multicolored operation is also possible in the quantum dots. When you look at the fabrication, you have a heterostructure. This is the vertical heterostructure which is being shown here. You initially clean it, then you do lithography. 
you so this is the top contact is existing here this is a basically these are unipolar structure that is either mostly nin or pip so you have an n plus n plus contact here and also n plus contact at the bottom so you want to bias between the top end and the bottom end contacts so initially you do mesa and h it down to the bottom contact then you do another for contact metals deposit do the lift off and then you have to anneal it to get omicity in the contact. So what you see in the uh, bottom le uh, left is basically the devices with the top contact and the bottom contact. Okay, you have to do wear bonding and carry out what is called the FTIR spectral response measurements. Okay, so here what you have is you have a broadband a global source here, broadband source. This light falls onto the sample and then which is which is housed in a cryostat and as a result photocurrent is generated and this photocurrent is then plotted as a function of wavelength okay so this is uh, a typical spectral response setup uh, as you see here this is the FTIR in full you have the current amplifier spectrum analyzer the cryostat the device sits here the global source is used from the FTIR and of course there is a temperature controller. You can vary the temperature uh, of the cryostat and thereby of the device. So there have been large number of devices. Uh, one was the using indium gallium arsenide quantum dots with an enal gas capping. This is called quaternary capping, indium aluminium gallium arsenide capping. And this was one of the early first device, but this was probably the best device that is demonstrated in literature which has very high detectivity of the order of 10 to the power 11 and high responsivity of the order of 2.1 amps per watt. The dots that we use are indium gallium arsenide and suppose we change the dot to indium arsenide. So basically what we are doing is we are playing around with the confinement. So starting with indium gallium arsenide, you might be having only two levels because it's a larger band gap. And then as you increase the indium composition, the confinement increases. So the number of levels in the conduction band increases. So you start seeing more and more of transitions and thereby more and more of peaks. So there's a multicolored response that you see from here. And that's exactly what we have seen in an indium arsenide based quantum dot detector, which is very similar to the previous one, just that the dots were indium arsenide. And you can see multiple peaks multiple very narrow peaks okay, or a multispectral response. And this was also verified from the 8-band K.P model. So these transitions were expected uh, based on the dot dimension that we are getting in the head to structure. The other thing that we checked is, uh, this was an indium, uh, that same sample, which we which I had shown the initial device. But here we started, we studied the impact of annealing, studied the impact of annealing. Okay, now here what you have seen is if you anneal, because these are strain mediated structures, you always have some defects and dislocations. And when you are annealing, then the responsivity increases by about uh, twice, two times, but the detectivity increases by almost um, five times or so. So there is some improvement that in the detect, uh, both the responsivity and the detectivity. If you go for very high temperature, then there is a degradation okay, in both responsivity and detectivity. I will show the impact of this result on the images from the focal plane array later on in the talk. We have also checked for the impact of ion implantation. And what we have done is we have carried out H minus ion implantation. We have seen an enhancement in the photoluminescence peak intensity. At the same time, when you are applying this ion implantation in devices, we have seen a reduction in the dark current density. So ion implantation acts in a way to passivate out defects. And as a result, not only the photoluminescence improves, but also the device performance improves as well. And this was done using H minus ions. What we have seen is uh, this was a 10 layer quantum dot heterostructure where the implantation was varied for various fluence. fluence. We, we have seen that the detectivity increases by almost one order. And okay, and along with that, 
the multicolor response which i was talk, talking of it also improves to some extent okay so there is a good impact of uh, ex situ treatments one is from the perspective of rapid thermal annealing the other is from the point of view of uh, ion implantation same thing we have seen also with protons that is h plus there is an enhancement in the photoluminescence intensity in protons as you uh, implant them with varying varying fluences keeping the energy fixed and we have noted again the same trend that also with protons that is h plus ions there is a reduction in the dark current density so so there is some kind of passivation that is uh, that is happening which is passivating out defects and thereby reducing the dark current density which in turn will also enhance the detector performance and as you see here for protons there is more than an order enhancement in the peak detectivity and it remains higher than the as grown sample even for lower for higher doses okay so i think the point to be uh, taken here is that uh, if you try out ex situ processes properly and if you optimize them that will ultimately reflect on the enhancement of performance of the actual devices that you are targeting now these were mostly ex situ rapid thermal annealing as well as uh, the ion implantation that is you grow the samples you take them out and then you do this ex situ processes but in situ that is you can vary the doping uh, sorry you can vary the strain so i have as i have discussed we can grow couple dot layers multiple bilayer trilayer pentalayer heptalayer and so on and so we are ushering in some amount of homogeneity in the dot size distribution so what is the impact of that we wanted to study the impact of coupling on devices with varying barriers so varying barrier means varying strain strain coupling or the electronic coupling that comes in here so the sample there is and it is compared with an uncoupled sample where the quantum dot layers are separated by a very thick barrier where there is no interaction between the various dot layers now in doing that we have seen that when the barrier is thin you see a response which is red shifted in terms of wavelength and also narrower if you look at the full width of maximum this is narrower compared to that sample d which is the uncoupled sample which is very broad okay which is not only broad which is also coming towards the lower wavelengths so higher energy so that is one thing we have seen that is the spectral response is narrower on account of coupling but what the other thing because peak detectivity is a very important parameter from the point of view of signal to noise ratio because if you are looking at wanting to do imaging in very noisy environment you would like to prefer uh, uh, devices with higher detectivity okay devices with higher detectivity and as you have seen here the sample b with the 15 nanometer shows the maximum for maximum detectivity and it, both the other samples a which is highly strained and c which is less strained compared to sample b are also showing higher detectivity compared to the sample d so through strain also we can vary the device performance and show the impact of this later on but if you remember i was showing you a modified growth strategy sample where we are getting very narrow quantum dot size distribution or rather very uniform quantum dot size distribution when we fabricated device out of that heterostructure we got a very narrow we got a very narrow spectral response and these are very useful for uh you know hyperspectral imaging application so you know if you do it well if, the, if you do the growth optimization properly you can very you can very easily get good quality devices so i'll quickly come to the demonstration of indigenous infrared focal plane arrays these are basically used for imaging signatures uh, human signatures more importantly and it requires a lot of infrastructure we have this entire thing at iit bombay a total of around 16 to 17 equipments are required starting from mb to pl to lithography to ebeam uh, etching and so on i'm not getting into all the details here it's a lot of equipments are used 
and we used one dot in a well heterostructure which was showing a response around in the long wavelength infrared window around 9.2 okay and this is four step lithography process where you go through four steps of mesa metal underbump metal and bump and these are all the different steps that you require to do one run of focal plane array and when you look at the acm images the this is the acm image of a mesa first step first level then that of the metal mesa with the metal then you have the mesa with the metal followed by the ubm so there are three two stacks here then you deposit indium initially it is like amorphous when you do uh, bump process reflow this this also requires a lot of optimization by the way then you create bumps okay and uh, so the tie the size required at spar mask was this but what we achieved was very close to what we intended then you do basically do flip chip bonding so you this is the detector part this is the detector part and this is the electronic silicon electronics part okay silicon electron you do uh, you do flip chip bonding so the after flip chip bonding uh, you have to do substrate removal so you have to remove these are back illuminated devices so you have to remove the entire substrate going through lapping polishing and wetting once you do that then you get a sample like this it should be more uh, uh, where the aluminum comes out the back uh, its top layer and this is this was as i started this was one of my first slides where we have shown the demonstration of focal plane uh, the indigenous focal plane array first one in the country but now that we can demonstrate uh, focal plane arrays we also wanted to study the impact of rta if you remember i had shown you that rapid thermal annealing improves quantum dot detector performance so nedt is the smallest temperature difference that one can sense and smaller the value of nedt the better so on the left hand side you see the nedt of 125 for as grown sample whereas it reduces to around 100 for rapid thermal annealing sample so not only from the detector perspective we have established that the detector performance is better by rapid thermal annealing but also from the image perspective we are showing the same results similarly when you are using h minus ion implantation i had shown you an enhancement in the detectivity by almost an order so what we have seen here is for an as grown sample these are all different samples okay you have to understand they are not the same samples which i am showing here in this case the nedt is around 240 millikelvin and with the h minus ion implantation it goes to goes down to 129 millikelvin so definitely the image quality is improving and finally if you remember i had shown you the variation in strain coupling variation in strain coupling so for the uncoupled sample the nedt was coming to be around 189 millikelvin and then with the strained sample that is one with the 15 nanometer barrier the nedt reduces to 101 millikelvin so i hope i could give you an idea of uh, the entire thing that we had gone through starting from initial material characterization to devious device optimization to demonstration of the quantum dot uh, indigenous quantum dot uh, focal plane array and also using uh, the results based on single result that we are getting from the single detector they were validated through the parallel experiments conducted on focal plane arrays with that uh, i would acknowledge the various funding agencies isro drdo dst meti uh, of course acrb and of course the main people who carry out this works are the phd students and the project staff and undergraduate students so thank you for your attention so thank you professor shivanand chakravarti for your detailed discussions uh, starting from the fabrications to that of your thermal imager and uh, so it is a very nice talk so i will request to the students and the participants to ask any questions to professor chakravarti because it was the first demonstrations of india regarding this thermal imager so uh, and regarding this um, device he also awarded Uh, i also uh, told you at the uh, initial stage that the award he has received in 
please ask him the questions. Anybody, you have any question, please? Okay, so I think, uh, yes. No, no, that's fine. I mean, I think okay. it's still too okay. early on a Saturday yeah, yeah. morning. <laughs> okay, so we'll contact with you, sir. Thank you yeah. for your nice talk, sir. Okay, thank you. Okay. We're going to start our second technical lecture, and <clears throat> that will be uh, given by our very young faculty, Dr. Deep Pokash Shamosdar. So Dr. Deep Pokash Shamosdar is an assistant professor in the Department of Electronics and Communications Engineering as at PDPM India Institute of Information Technology, Design and Manufacturing Technology, IIT DM, uh, Jabalpur, India since 2017. He received his PhD degree on the experimental and theoretical investigations of 3 pipe bismite semiconductor in 2016 from University of Calcutta after the completions of his BSc physics, BTEC radio physics and electronics and NTEC radio physics and electronics degrees from the same university in 2007, 2010, and 2012, respectively. Till date, he has authored more than 90 research articles in pre-reviewed journals and conference proceedings. His research interest includes DFT calculations of 3.5 semiconductor nanostructures, quantum dot and quantum wells, optoelectronic properties of 3.5 semiconductors, 3.5 nanostructure based hybrid solar cells, novel electronic devices, fin fats, NC fats, TEFTS, etc., and 3.5 quantum dot photo detectors. He is a senior member of ITBL. So, with this short introduction, I'll invite Dr. Deep for his technical lecture. Thank you, sir, uh, for your uh, nice introduction. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, as I already told, the uh, uh, topic of my talk is uh, nanostructured solar cells for low cost photovoltaics. And uh, uh, I would like to give a short overview of uh, what we are doing uh, basically in our institute. Uh, mostly we perform theoretical calculations. Uh, and I will try to give a short overview of what we are actually doing. So, okay. So uh, today I would just, uh, first of all, I just want to let you know about the potential of solar energy. Uh, though the share of solar energy is uh, very low, uh, less uh, is in compared to the global uh, consumption of uh, energy in uh, as compared to the non-renewable sources of energy. But uh, the potential of solar energy, which uh, you can see on the right hand side of the slide, uh, you can see that uh, as compared to the wind energy or other non-renewable sources of energy, the potential of solar energy is huge. And uh, uh, it's a fact that the earth gets more solar energy in one hour than the entire world uh, uses in a whole year. That's the potential of solar energy. So uh, we should... It is not changing. Your slide is not changing. Sir, okay. What is the problem? It's uh, the now first... It's changing. Now it's changing. Okay. Okay, sir. Uh, okay, fine, sir. So uh, uh, the so the art gets more solar energy in one hour than the entire world uses in a year. Uh, that's the potential of solar energy. So uh, we must try to utilize the potential of solar energy with the help of different photovoltaic devices. First of all, we'll talk about the different light trapping strategies. Uh, we have uh, we mostly use this nanostructured. Uh, uh, nanostructures in our solar cells as the anti-deflection coatings uh, because these anti-deflection coatings help to maximize the optical path length uh, of the sunlight into the solar cells through multiple reflections and uh, naturally we require much low, lesser thickness of the absorber layer uh, which uh, reduces the cost of the solar cells that's the use of the nanostructures it promotes multiple reflection at the cost of uh, lesser thickness of the absorber layer. So we can see here that I have shown three diagrams over here in which, uh, first of all, we have used nanostructures which are much uh, smaller uh, 
in comparison or the period between the nanostructure is much smaller than the wavelength of light okay so in this case the nanostructure act like anti reflection structures secondly when it becomes equal to the wavelength of light it reduces the reflection but at the same time it enhances the optical path length also and in the third case we have used certain bigger nanostructures where uh, the period between the nanostructures is much greater as compared to the wavelength of light here also it provides anti reflection properties only at the front, uh, it increases the optical path length but the overall reflection is reduced so we should try to uh, make uh, we should try to select the dimensions of the nanostructures in such a way so that it matches with the wavelength of light so that we can utilize its anti reflection properties next why nanostructures uh, i have shown a diagram over here uh, we have calculated this uh, and we can see that uh, if we see the graph over here we can see that the absorption rate of the nanostructures is much greater as compared to the conventional solar cells it is improved much uh, because the re reflection or the reflectance from the nanostructures is reduced to a great extent which promotes the absorption and secondly it also helps to concentrate and absorb the light efficiently and secondly uh, the nanostructures also help to improve the collection efficiency and improve the carrier transport properties of uh, the in, in case of the solar cells that's the benefit it improves the absorptance it uh, reduces the reflectance and it also improves the charge harvesting properties of the solar cells Second is the uh, we will talk about the hybrid photovoltaics, and in case of hybrid photovoltaics, uh, what we do uh, in, in the active layer, we actually select uh, a combination of a of an inorganic semiconductor and an organic material. And uh, why do we do that? Because both of them have certain ad, uh, advantages. Like inorganic materials, they have high carrier mobility. Like for example, if we use the three five materials, they have got high carrier mobility. better environmental stability and they can also uh, capture a larger range of the absorption spectra due to their tunable band gap that's the importance of the inorganic materials but on the other hand the organic materials uh, they are cost efficient lightweight flexible and the cost of processing is very low okay and uh, in case of hybrid solar cells we have achieved uh, 15% of photo conversion efficiency but that's improving day by day so that's why we are trying to use the beneficial properties of both the inorganic materials and organic materials in the solar cells by means of hybrid photovoltaic devices next uh, what is the working principle i am not going into the details of this uh, working principle is basically uh, in case of the hybrid solar cell it is a four step process uh, first is the photon absorption and the excitant generation uh, excitant is basically a coulombic uh, combination of an of an electron and hole where they are uh, they are actually bound together with the help of strong coulombic forces second is the excitant diffusion with the help of the electric field that is generated at the interface of the two materials excitant dissociation that means the electrons and holes are then separated and finally the charge transport and collection uh, that means the charges which are separated are transported to their respective electrodes that's the four basic principles in case of uh, hybrid solar cells and in inorganic material uh, in organic materials the conduction band and the valence band they are similar to the homo and the lumo levels homo means the highest occupied molecular orbital and lumo means the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital so th so they are analogous the conduction band and the valence band uh, and here uh, on the uh, over here i have shown uh, the uh, band gap of different uh, uh three five materials as well as the, uh, as well as some of the commonly used organic materials like the p3ht and the p.pss these are mostly combined with the three five materials like gallium arsenide indium phosphate uh you know as because they generate very high voc okay and at the same time they also help to get better uh short circuit current density in case of solar cells which is the main uh, benefit in case of using this material then we will show what are these uh, nano air solar cells so you can obviously see that in planar solar cells the reflection uh, from the planar substrate is not uh, it, it is uniform uh, 
but when we design different dimensional nano structures of the nanowires the diffusion is not uniform uh, sorry the reflection is not uniform so obviously it promotes the uh, absorptance within the nano structures and, and reduces the reflection to a great amount as we can see from the uh, from from the diagram itself the reflection is reduced to a great extent because the uh, uh, the photons they are trapped uh, with, uh, inside the nano nano structures and uh, uh, at the same time i have also shown over here a diagram that the charge transport as well as the collection efficiency uh, that is also uh, favorable in case of nano or solar cells and uh, uh, so the high aspect ratio and the smaller dimensions of the nano structure they are very suitable for solar cell applications because uh, they reduce the cost to a great extent uh, then is the radial versus the axial nanowires. Radial means uh, we are going to uh, have the P and the N junctions in the radial direction, like what I have shown over here. And in case of axial junctions, uh, the N and the P type structures are drawn one over the other. But it has been found that the efficiency and uh, the overall photovoltaic parameters is much more improved uh, in case of radial type uh, junctions radial type solar cells uh, because of its multiple benefits like it reduces reflection it also helps in better charge separation charge collection and also maximize the uh, light trapping properties but in case of axial junctions uh, it, it is not so much uh, beneficial okay so that is why we try to mostly design the radial junction solar cells so uh, in this lecture, I will talk about a couple of nanostructures so like uh, the nano pyramids. So you can see that uh, the nano pyramids, they have a low surface area uh, in comparison to the other nanostructures. And secondly, the graded refractive index profile, because uh, it, it's like a triangular pattern of the refractive index found over here. It actually helps in efficient charge transport. That's the benefit of these nano pyramid structures. And uh, here I have shown uh, 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 a diagram of some of one research paper which was published in the nano letters and uh, it comprises of a combination of nano pyramids and nano wires and it helps to reduce the multiple reflections or it reduces the reflectance as well as promote the charge separation and transport properties uh, that's why uh, we can see that it produces higher pc in comparison to the uh, planar solar cells next Next is the nanocones. Uh, nanocones, uh, they actually the longer nanowires, they actually suffer from recombination losses. And uh, secondly, uh, the unconformal coating uh, over the metal electrodes in case of nanowires that degrades the PC. So uh, we use nanocones as a replacement of nanowires because the nanocones have a stronger base and they are mechanically more robust. Okay, and secondly, the tapered structure, this helps in conformal coating uh, of the polymers. And as a result, this, uh, it has been also found that if we make the cones tapered, some beneficial characteristics are obtained, which I will discuss uh, in my subsequent slides. So what we do, actually, we use a particular software uh, called the Numerical, uh, which uh, basically utilizes the FDTD method uh, uh finite uh, difference time time uh, fdtd method is basically used in order to calculate the uh, optical generation rates as well as the optical properties of the nano nanowires and uh, it utilizes and finally the optical generation rate or the absorption characteristics which we calculate uh, using the FDTD method that is imported into the device module of the software in order to calculate the photovoltaic parameters. And in FDTD method, basically the uh, Maxwell's equation or discretized Maxwell's equations are solved. And with the help of the AM 1.5 spectrum and 100% internal quantum efficiency, uh, we calculate the different properties like the optical JSC or the photo generation rate in case of FDTD. Uh, calculations and so first of all we will discuss about the gallium arsenide nano pyramid so over here you can see that uh, here what i have done uh, 
there are certain assumptions for example uh, we use the periodic boundary conditions on the two uh, on both sides of the nanowires uh, that means we actually simulate only one nanowire but we consider that there are infinite number of nanowires okay uh, so that it reduces the computational cost and it uh, actually replicates the action of all the nanowires and PML boundary conditions is assumed on the top and the bottom sides in order to reduce the reflectance or losses due to the impedance mismatch. And uh, here we place a reflectance monitor and a transmittance monitor to calculate the reflectance rate and the transmittance rate. And absorption is calculated as one minus R lambda minus T lambda. That is how we calculate the absorptance. So here we have used a tapered nano pyramid and it's very interesting uh, if you see the photogeneration plots over here, if we compare uh, the tapered nano pyramids with the uh, sharp edge uh, nano uh, or original nano pyramids, so you can see that the photogeneration rate is enhanced in case of the tapered profiles. Okay, so naturally we obtain higher JSC in case of the modified nano pyramid structure or the tapered nano pyramid structure. So that's why we try to. Uh, continue our research using this tapered nano pyramid structures. Next is uh, we have done some analysis like we have uh, seen how the carrier lifetime, the SRV that is the surface recombination velocity, how they are going to affect the photovoltaic, uh, photovoltaic parameters. Then the mobility in case of the nanowires because when we design the nanostructure, the mobility reduces to a great extent in case of the nanowires or the nanostructures, okay? And it has been found that uh, with the help of a car low carrier lifetime and uh, low SRV, if the surface recombination velocity is low and the lifetime is low, uh, then we are ab able to achieve very high PC, okay? Uh, even if the uh, mobility is low. So that's how uh, we uh, have done a contour plot over here. And you can see that if the Obviously, if the mobility is high, we can get uh, higher values of VOC or JSC or the photovoltaic parameters. And uh, at the same time, we can see that if the surface recombination velocity is low, then we are able to achieve very good photovoltaic parameters in, over here. Then here uh, in the next uh, slide, uh, what we have done, we have used uh, an electron selective contact of uh, TA205 and uh, it has been found that uh, when we are using some electron selective contact like TA205, uh, uh, it uh, promotes the transport of the electrons and obviously the absorptance is also improved. And here I have uh, shown here two types of nanostructures. One is the rectangular nanowire and another is the uh, uh, cylindrical nanowire and not much difference has been found uh, in case of the uh, two nanostructures, almost their, uh, their absorption rate is same between the two type of nanostructures. The only difference is uh, that when we use a bare nanostructure, the absorption rate is low, but when we give an electron selective contact like Ta2O5, which is an oxide, so it promotes the electron transport and it also helps in uh, better device characteristics. And at the same time, its absorption characteristics is also improved due to its high bandwidth. Next is uh, we have used certain truncated nano pyramids, uh, which I have already shown uh, in my previous slides. So I just want to sh show what uh, uh, we do actually. We first of all try to optimize the geometric dimensions of the nanowires and uh, of the nanostructures. And we can see that when the base width of the nanostructures is like 240 nanometer, you can see the highest JC is opt obtained. Okay, and we fix that optimized dimension. We carry the subsequent uh, analysis using that optimized dimensions. Okay, so here I have shown the photo generation rate and you can see that for 240 nanometer, the photo generation rate is also higher and it is being distributed throughout the entire nanostructure. So that's the benefit of uh, uh, this uh, optimization of uh, these nanostructures. Then here I have shown another diagram. So here, as I told that we have done the, uh, it, it shows better uh, uh, resolution. Okay, so 
what I have done here. So I have tapered the pyramids over here. And you can see that in case of the tapered pyramids uh, over here, you can see the higher generation rates and it is distributed. But in case of the uh, normal uh, nano pyramids, you can see over the short edges, there is very low generation rate. Okay, so uh, the electrodes which are deposited over here, so the collection efficiency of the electrodes deteriorates. Okay, so that's why uh, the better generation rate, what you can see that modified nano pyramids, its generation rate is higher. As a result, it gets gives high optical JSC, high reflectance, and all the things actually are improved in case of tapered nanostructures. Okay, so uh, here uh, one kind of electrical analysis is done. Here actually the carrier lifetime and the doping concentration is varied. And obviously with higher doping concentration and higher lifetime actually, uh, uh, we can see that uh, JSC or the VOC or the photo conversion efficiency uh, that is improved, okay, with uh, in, in case of uh, the tapered structures. So in another electrical analysis, I have shown over here, uh, you can see that uh, over here, I have varied the um, surface recombination velocity and the mobility. And obviously with higher mobility and low SRV, we are getting good characteristics over here. So these are all electrical parameters which we can vary to study the effect on the photovoltaic parameters. So uh, mostly we uh, play with four different parameters like the surface recombination velocity, doping concentration, mobility and the carrier lifetime. These four parameters are very important in order to control the uh, photovoltaic uh, parameters Okay, in case of solar cells. And uh, this is the JV characteristics uh, of the conventional nanopyramid and modified nanopyramid. And we can see in case of modified nanopyramid, 19.83. Uh, this is the photo conversion efficiency in comparison to the conventional pyramid, which is only 12.69. So it's better if we go with the this uh, conventional uh, with the tapered nano pyramid structure to in very good characteristics. Then in another work, uh, what we have done, we have made ITO free INP uh, nanowire solar cells. Mostly the ITO is used as the contact in case of this uh, nanowire uh, or the nano structured solar cells. Uh, it is indium tin oxide and it is a trans. with an organic polymer, which is acting like an electrode. And it is also helping uh, as a, uh, it is also acting like an electron transport layer. Okay. So we have considered here uh, some four different cases where we have used ITO and we have used uh, P dot PSS in place of ITO. And we have used two type of structures. One is you can see this is a conformal coating in which uh, uh, the coating over the nanowire exactly replicates the dimensions of the nanowire. You can see here, this is the conformal coating. These are conformal coating, but infiltrated coating, the entire space between the nanowires is filled. That is called the infiltrated coating. Okay. And it has been found that with conformal coating, it reduces the material cost one on one hand, and it also promotes efficient charge transport on the other hand. So it has multiple benefits. Okay. So that's why we go with mostly conformally coated uh, conformal coatings in case of nan different type of nanostructures. And you can see here from the JV characteristics also, we can see that uh, uh, ITO free solar cells, these are yielding better characteristics. So here I have shown one uh, comparison. So CP dot PSS means conformally coated P dot PSS over IMP nanowires, and it yields highest uh, PC, almost 24% PC. This is Obviously, theoretical the experimental work will vary to some extent. Okay. Uh, then these are uh, again IMP nanostructures with electron selective contact. Uh, we have discussed about gallium arsenide. We have done some analysis with INP also, where we have used molybdenum oxide uh, over uh, INP nanowires. And obviously, again, it yielded very good characteristics uh, with this uh, uh, electron selective contacts. Uh, I would like to show you the uh, plots over here. Uh, these are for uh, the first one is for bare uh, nanowires, and the second one is for the coated nanowires. Okay, and you can see that the electric field, instead of getting distributed in the place between the nanowires, it is 
being concentrated on the top portion of the nanowires and as a result of that it is not actually being distributed in the space between the nanowires so it actually promotes the carrier transport or the charge separation okay so that's beneficial okay the electric field is not being lost from the nanowires so uh, that is very beneficial and it has been found that uh, almost 25% efficiency is obtained with uh, uh, this uh, electron selective contacts of uh, mo3 or tantalum oxide so it's very good one uh, the last work which i want to show that we have used uh, certain metal nanoparticles uh, in our work uh, on the top in between the nano pyramids and at the bottom also which can be done by the process of sputtering okay so what we do over here we actually uh, whenever we carry any analysis first of all we try to optimize the geometric dimensions so we have uh, optimized the height of the nano pyramids we have optimized the period of the nano pyramids we have tried to optimize the base width of the nano pyramids and at the same time we had done the same analysis uh, for the metallic nanoparticles also okay we have tried to uh, optimize their radius also okay so first of all we design the optimized structure and then we carry the entire analysis so here uh, this is a silicon nano pyramid i have used then metal nanoparticles and finally over that i have we have deposited p dot pss which is a uh, polymer as you know so this is a hybrid solar cell and these are the optimization results and you can see that uh, optimization is done with the help of uh, optical jsc okay so obviously you can see that we obtain the highest optical jsc and then the optical jsc deteriorated so this is for example over here like uh, d top d top means the uh, diameter of the top nanoparticle this is fixed to 20 nanometer because it it is yielding the highest jsc over here okay so in this way we try to optimize the dimensions over here so these are some electric field plots so obviously you can see the plasmoning effect over here uh, the electric field is enhanced okay over uh, in, in, at the side of this uh, agn piece okay so it, it is beneficial in terms of uh, obtaining a high electrical jsc okay so uh, these are some of the reference i have used in my work uh, okay thank you Thank you, Dr. Deep, for your uh, nice presentation and regarding the FTDD simulation uh, on the solar cell for Thanks. the uh, increasing the efficiency of the solar cell by using the anti-reflection coating at the front panel of the device. So it's a very good work. So uh, uh, I'll request the participants uh, to ask questions to Dr. Deep. You have anything in your mind, please. Uh, can I ask? Yes. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, sure. Uh, please, uh, you used uh, PDOT instead of uh, ITO. Yes, and, sir. And uh, uh, PDOT, as I know, is known as a um, so, uh, deposited from solution in water. Do you know the ability of uh, your uh, nanocons or your nano nanostructures? I mean, uh, in your, uh, so inorganic material of inorganic materials. Are the uh, are the water so, so, so solution of a P dot wet <laughs> to this? Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, it can be deposited, sir, with the help of spin coating technique over the nano Okay, so, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, so would you would you sir please repeat the question? No, I, sir? I, I mean wettability, wettability of uh, wettability of uh, P dot onto the surface of these inorganic materials. Yes, I know wettability of uh, Water to silicon surface uh, is not good. Uh -huh. What about uh, in other materials? You sir, you are talk, talking about the stability or like that, sir? About the no. repeatability. What, wettability. Uh -huh. wettability. So when you use spin oh, quality. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, sir, uh, there are some experimental works already done on this, okay? So, uh, already this P dot PSS has been deposited on some silicon-based nanostructures, okay? And uh, instead of uh, this ITO, and uh, some good results have been obtained. So, we have done uh, this thing 
with our INP and gallium arsenide nanoversite. We have tried to do the same thing over here. Mm -hmm. So it works in practice. It works. It works, sir. It works. Okay, thank you. There are some stability issues, sir. Uh, obviously, because uh, 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 so, but uh, research is being carried on in that field also in order to uh, mitigate the stability issues. So it works actually, sir. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, sir. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so if the audience do not have any questions, so I have one question to yeah. Dr. Deep. Yes, sir. Uh, so you have basically simulated the yes, anti reflection coating by using the 3 pipe semiconductor, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so uh, what do you think uh, if we use the anti reflection coating by uh, the metal oxide semiconductor? Yes. So it will be better than 3 pipe? Uh, sir, uh, metal oxide semiconductors like, uh, for example, the last work we have shown, like uh, mm -hmm. we have used some metal nanoparticles and on that we have given some coating. Okay, mm -hmm. so it also works uh, over there, but uh, mm -hmm. the charge transport properties, uh, that mm -hmm. is better in case in, in case of 3.5 nanoverse. The charge transport mm -hmm. is enhanced in case of 3.5 mm -hmm. nanoverse mm -hmm. that we have found. But but the 3.5 semiconductor and triplexion coating, if you use, the refractive mm -hmm. index of uh, that three pipe semiconductor is very very large as compared mm -hmm. to that of the metal oxide semiconductor. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. in that case, uh, there will be a probability of total internal reflections, right? Yeah. So again, again, I think the regarding the transparency of the um, uh, that anti reflections coating, mm -hmm. it will mm -hmm. be better to use the metal oxide semiconductor. Okay, what sir. We will, we will we will try with that one, sir. Uh, let us check out, check it out. So we have just uh, uh, not focused uh, till now on the oxide, this metal oxide. So we'll try. Okay. Thank you, okay. sir, for your suggestion. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. We'll talk okay. later. Okay. Okay. So, okay. okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Deep, for your nice talk uh, on FTTD simulation. We'll definitely will contact you uh, some of the technical matter later on. Thank you. Yes, sir, thank you very much, sir. It was a nice uh, experience to talk over here. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I'm going to introduce uh, to Professor J. Kumar. So Professor J. Kumar is a professor of Crystal Growth Center, Anna University, Chennai. His field of interest is the MOCVD semiconductor crystal growth characterizations and device fabrications organic LEDs. His main research interest is nitride and related alloys and on dilute magnetic semiconductors. First principle calculations of half metallic effect in uh, half metallic effect and cobalt army, uh, cobalt iron silicon alloy thin films and then targeted drug delivery system and biosensors. So uh, he has teaching experience for the UG for 25 years, PG for 25 years, and he has research experience over 31 years. So he has several awards. So he has awarded Jawaharlal Nehru Memorial uh, Award in 1981, DAE Young Scientist Award in 1995, Active Consultant Award in Anna University 2011, Asia Pacific Academy of Materials Academicians in 2013, Tamil Nadu Scientist Award for Physical Science 2012. He is a member of Indian Space Research Organization Standing Working Group of Microgravity, a member of Board of Studies Physics, uh, Physics in Trichy, uh, University 2011 to 2013, member of Research Advisory Council uh, of uh, Chennai uh, Colors in 2010, Governing Counseling member UGC nominee uh, Inter University Accelerator Center from 2011 to 2013. He has research publications in the journal more than 150. He has three books publications and more than 220 conference paper publication. With this short introduction, I'll uh, invite to Professor J. Kumar um, for starting his technical talk. Sir, please. 
Good morning, and I thank uh, every one of you who have joined uh, this uh, international webinar. I am very thankful to my great friend Dr. Mondal for organizing this event with many speakers from all over the country and in Canada. Uh, this talk uh, is something which I had been uh, trying to understand for several years, at least in the past uh, six to eight years. So if I don't uh, uh, explain or if I don't meet your expectations, I would like to correct myself and uh, make uh, appropriate improvements. So one of the fundamental to this uh, talk was uh, the theoretical work we have been carrying out in band structure calculations. Thanks to one of the initiatives by a former colleague. Sir, uh, sir. See, the idea of this talk is to introduce a topic which perhaps is more dear to all of you. And I saw several speakers talking about this particular domain, which has got a Nobel Prize about five years ago. And uh, I would like to present something on Somebody is Hello? Somebody, your microphone is on. Off your microphone. Somebody has on your microphone. Please mute. Mute your microphone, please. Okay. So. Tunable materials, as many of you know by now, because uh, I saw several topics related to topological activities, so many of you may know by now. But for my own reasons of uh, continuity and uh, easiness, I'm trying to introduce the way I like it or the way I've been understanding it for the last uh, five, six years. As I said, uh, many of my students worked on different aspects of band structure calculations. And as was introduced, I had been working on semiconductors and mainly on uh, focusing on gallium nitride for uh, LED applications. We have a huge MOCVD established over the last 10 years. And in addition to that, uh, for various reasons of understanding, we worked on theoretical aspects of uh, the gallium nitride, particularly with respect to ferromagnetic uh, dopants and uh, trying to uh, simulate some conditions for spintronics. As once again, many of you may know, spintronics is all about control and manipulation of the spin state of the electron. While we control the spin, uh, the rather the simple charge state of the electron with respect to electronics. And in auto electronics, we combine both photons and the electrons. And in simple photonics, we try to control and manipulate a photon with respect to its energy uh, issues. So this is where uh, we all started. And as I said, uh, we have been working on uh, doping the gallium nitride in a theoretical way uh, with respect to a P-type uh, material, because as we know, in a P-type material, the electrons are minority carriers. And so therefore, it is easy to control and manipulate the spin state, particularly if you want to have a polarized spin. And uh, that's where we started. And uh, slowly, in uh, understanding these aspects, we ended up with the interactions with the DMRL Hyderabad, which gave us an assignment to work on uh, Husserl alloys. I don't want to go into the details, but uh, essentially that gave us uh, some um, understanding of uh, different material systems. And thereby, we also try to understand something which is uh, very unique. And I, uh, in particular, had uh, some exposure to these uh, topological materials as I was asked to make a presentation in UK on functional materials by one of the earlier speakers of this uh, webinar, Professor Henini. So I had the opportunity to understand in detail about something on functional materials. Uh, in short, uh, for those who are very interested to understand what is a functional material, if you take an elephant, uh, many of you might have seen, or uh, know that uh, the elephant can lift a huge uh, trunk of a tree, which may weigh even close to 500 kilograms or half a ton. And the same elephant can delicately pick up a strong uh, strand or a single uh, um, a herb or a small grass. And that is where the uh, tusk uh, or the trunk of the elephant, uh, tusk of the elephant is uh, tuned to be a functional uh, uh, material system. It's just to give an, uh, uh, a kind of understanding 
what is a functional material it can do a very complicated job it can do a very delicate job or you can tune the properties in order to effectively make it uh, do your uh, or functionally uh, uh, contribute to your interest on a material system this is not just about making a material to uh, lift an object or touch an object or make a sensor of an object it is also about understanding the fundamentals of uh, the uh, physics aspects of it so many of you might have been uh, impressed by oilus uh, theorem or oilus contributions the only person to my knowledge who has contributed to time understanding is oiler it's uh, spelled in my way as i see in the wikipedia it is uh, 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 phonetically spelled as uh, oiler but uh, grammar the vocabulary or the word stands as e u l e r he had been working in very many places very strangely maybe those times demanded those kind of situations but he had been working on uh, shipyards and places of that nature but he had been moving from switzerland to many places poland russia etc but i was very surprised that a man can contribute at such an early period on uh, what is an understanding of uh, time scale uh, time scale is very uh, intriguing or a kind of complex phenomena for physics people because we understand everything in mk system to have a scale of positive and negative frames but in time scale we don't have this negative aspects so it keeps moving that's one of the aspect in simple term if you try to have yourself positioned in your sitting place and if you see somebody moving across or somebody moving in the forward direction or in the backward direction you can simply say he is moving with respect to a time scale t equal to t1 the other person is moving in the forward direction as t2 and therefore you know that there is a movement and it can be called as a time variant because that person has moved in time and it can be called as a time variant whereas if somebody is moving on your left hand side or on the right hand side it should be termed as a time invariant problem so these understandings of a, a contour or so called a state of matter is called as the study of uh, topological time invariant problems so if you try to take as you see in this picture uh, some small piece of paper which can be folded in the way you want it it could have been folded as to meet the either ends it could have been a straight line at the initial stage and if these ends are made to meet you can make a simple circle or you can make an ellipse or you can make a distorted uh, system like what you see here you can have two such objects also made as you see in the insert but it's still the study of continuity and connectivity this is where the whole concept evolved and as i said band structure calculations made this kind of understandings to be more possible uh, sometimes we wonder what as to what theoretical concepts can do but unless there is a huge picture of a theoretical problem and if you do not have a conceptual idea of a theoretical situation you will not be able to make a device or even understand the real situations inside a material system where there are several cases of several observations made one such is known as the hall effect and i will deal with it in some more detail as i go by the next few slides one of the fundamental principles we are all agree at this stage is that the, we have a spin up and a spin down state or a spin plus of or minus of state and if you take a quantum well which is nothing but your optical mouse all of us use in today's world this optical mouse connected to your computer or your laptop and it gives a small light signal which uh, makes you work comfortably without the older mouse which had to be cleaned once in a while so this optical mouse works with the principles of quantum well and this is what we have done in our emotivity work as many of you know in the band structure we can have a simple projection of the valence band and the conduction band the valence band is reflected by the valence electrons and the conduction band is only an inverse inverse situation if there is an attraction or a repulsion with respect to the neighboring atom or the electron of the neighboring atom then you cannot overlap the valence band and therefore you try to project it as an inverted situation of the valence band which you call as a conduction band and in the valence band the electrons moves to a maximum potential energy at the midpoint and then it falls back the reason is there is an attraction or it could be a repulsion so while the electron keeps moving 
but when the electron moves there is a change of momentum and this change of momentum can contribute either as a change of mass or as a change of velocity if there could have been a change of velocity the electron which reaches the, uh, the peak position of the valence band would have to be just shooting off like an arrow and therefore we just try to understand that there can be a change in mass which is conceptually more easier to understand it it is in practical is also correctly understood so there is a change in mass and this change in mass is what is called as an effective mass which is at the peak position and this effective mass contributes to the mobility which is different with respect to different semiconductors as you know in your mobile phone you use gallium mosfet whereas in your uh, computer or in your laptop you use the silicon which is for the electronic device aspects so in both of them why do we use uh, in a uh, mobile phone a direct band cap material of gallium arsenide right? is because it has the highest electron mobility which is eight times or nine times more than that of silicon this is one of the reasons there are other reasons as well but given the fact that there is a higher mobility you can very clearly understand that there is a very clear change in the effective mass and this effective mass contributes to this kind of device structures now back to this particular issue of topology as i said it is about the field of study of the geometry and set theory and it can uh, clarify very many aspects of space dimension and transformation transformation is like a structural transformation or any other aspects of transformation as what we call as a symmetrical transformation so here if you have a surface state that surface, surface state can interact i have a couple of more slides in the next uh, uh, couple of uh, view graphs which will be more uh, clarifying with respect to these surface states and the contribution in uh, some kind of a cartoonistic way as well but you can see here i have the fermi level at which is always at the uh, gap between the connection band and the valence band which is known as the forbidden gap and so you have the fermi level and within this fermi level you see there are some surface states they can contribute this could be one electron in the up state and the electron which is coming down or it could be contributing as the down state also so this particular point is known as a dirac cone i will explain in more detail in the next few slides as i keep telling so a tunable material is what is of interest for various reasons i will have to go quickly away from this because i have more serious slides to show it to you but you can take it from here that if there is an electromagnetic wave which interacts with the meta material then this wave can be transmitted reflected or absorbed but the lattice structure of the tunable meta material can be adjusted in real time making it possible to configure a meta material meta material you can very simply understand as to have a negative band gap uh, or a negative refract index okay so this is one another interesting fundamental which i want to highlight so if you have two material layers which are separated by you know, atomic distances or let us say about 1 nanometers or so which is still 10 times the number of atoms and if they are separated you can pronouncedly see an effect which is known as a kashmiri effect which is basically because of the density of states difference between two subsequent layers and this can produce very high pressures of the order of one atmosphere as you can see here and this is one aspect of it which is very interesting for people to understand what kind of uh, meta materials can be created or what is the situation when you have very thin layer of materials or when you have a contour or a configuration of material the way you want it which is known as also an artificial uh, crystal or let us say uh, a kind of layer which can be created according to your domain interest so these are terms which are used sphere like degenerate torus as you can see if you have a ring ball like thing and if there are vertices flowing around this and if you can configure reconfigure this vertices i had a good uh, demo of it but unfortunately it's perhaps not working here let me see no it's not working it's okay so a topologist is someone who cannot differentiate between let's say this is a donut many of you might have seen this or a small ring ball this can be configured into a tea cup or a coffee mug and this is where you don't see the difference when you are called as a topologist but there are still ways to understand distinguish this this is for example what is known as a genus this is what euler uh, projected or picturized so the genus of a connected orientable uh, surface is an integer representing the maximum number of cuttings along non intersecting for example these lines are non intersecting lines closed simple curves without rendering the resultant manifold disconnected 
if you try to unfold a globe, for example, you can create a, a plain paper, but that can be called as a genus zero. Okay, for example, if you have a globe which is a solid uh, sphere and then still it has intersecting um, curves, so it can be called as a genus zero. On the other hand, you can cut them into slices and you can have a genus one and you can also create terms which are called as genus two and, and this could be genus three, for example. So this is defined in terms of the all your characteristics as chi where the relationship chi equal to 2 minus 2g for a closed surface and if it has surfaces with boundary components these are very essential for my discussions because my surfaces of topological materials are going to have certain boundary components and that's why i'm trying to project all these things so that way it will be chi equal to 2 minus 2g minus of b which is the boundary component so natural materials can always be uh, having a weak coupling through the magnetic component of the electromagnetic wave, whereas artificial materials exhibit a strong magnetic coupling known as metamaterials or can be defined as metamaterials. I'm not going into the details because I have something more to discuss for my own uh, reasons. So topology begins with the study of curves, surfaces and other objects in a plane. And one of the ideas in topology is that spatial objects like circle or sphere can be treated as objects in their own right because circle, as you know, it's a two-dimensional uh, mapping and the sphere is a three-dimensional system, but they can be distinguished as they are independent and uh, they are represented as embedded in space. So if you have a, a circle and if you just remove one midpoint or just cut that circle in some point, it could become a line segment and that line segment can be made to an ellip ellipse and it can also be entangled or meaning it can be uh, overlayered so that as you saw in the first slide which I showed, so it can be in an entangled state or in an ordered circle, etc. So you can understand space time from general relativity and similarly you can understand fractals, knots, manifolds with understanding of these uh, topologies. Phase spaces is another important thing which is necessary for our discussions here. Phase space means in physics you can simply hand, uh, take a space of a uh, hand position of a clock. You know, you all remember, you see your watches. You have uh, a hand position, which can be a smaller handle and, and the longer hand, which shows the hour and the uh, minute. So if you just try to separate this hour and minute positions, you have a small space around it and that space can also be called as a phase space. So this kind of situations, can also be understood by means of understanding this symmetric groups like uh, rotating a top or collective activities which can happen. I'm just trying to uh, express some of the important advantages of this kind of metamaterials or what we call as uh, uh, materials which has a mechanical property which is different with respect to the original or naturally occurring material also. I'm not going into the details. You can create 3D super hydrophobic materials there should be some easiness to understand any material. And so I'm just trying to throw some light on what are the ways one can try to use this kind of discussions or materials. One of the fundamental to this discussion should be on Hall effect. We all know what is an Hall effect. So if you apply a magnetic field on a sample of semiconductor, for example, and if you pass current, there will be a voltage which will be measured, which is known as a Hall voltage, which is nothing but the Lorentz force which drives the electron which is flowing across from one end to the other end as you drive a current and then when they accumulate because of the charge imbalances and when they accumulate from the top and the bottom you have a voltage generated or a potential difference generated that is what we measure as a Hall voltage. This is as simple as that which makes people to understand as I told you in the initial stages if you have a silicon, you can measure its mobility, you can measure its conductivity, you can measure the number of free carriers which are available. And if you have gallium oxide, you can also measure its properties in terms of sigma or in terms of the N, E and mu values, which are very essential to differentiate between one kind of a semiconductor to the other kind of a semiconductor and thereby use it for a given application which needs fast switching or which needs a very raw way of handling things. It is nothing like a mobility prevents an activity but still it has an advantage that's why you use it in your mobile phone to have a very high frequency operation and that is how you try to uh, communicate also whereas this all effect other than this x-ray crystallography 
which pro produced so many Nobel laureates and perhaps equivalent was the uh, work which held many Nobel prizes is the area on astrophysics or astronomy. And to my knowledge, uh, please pardon me if I'm making such statements, to my knowledge, the Hall effect or the Hall related activity has gained many Nobel prizes as like many other, uh, uh, unlike uh, many other activities. Because in all effect, we have a uh, integer quantum Hall effect, uh, which is known as a quantum mechanical version of the uh, Hall effect in a two dimensional electron system. And it's essentially at very low temperatures or sub zero or uh, let's say liquid nitrogen or liquid helium temperature and a very strong magnetic field, which the Hall conductivity sigma takes the context values of mu c square by h and you can take value of 1, 2, 3 as integers or it can take values of fractional values like uh, you see here 1 by 3 or 2 by 5, etc. The fractional Hall effect is actually more complicated as its existence relies fundamentally on electron-electron interactions and it is very well understood as integer Hall effect, not of electrons, but of charge flux composites known as composite fermions. I will be using most of these terms so please watch very carefully or try to follow it. So the images that appear at the bottom here is an example of Hall effect of a topological uh, material on its exhibition of a topological quantum number. These topological quantum number in mathematical terms are known as churn numbers and they are closely related to what is known as a very space. I don't want to go into the details, but the butterfly structure or a small butterfly uh, nature you see here in the vertical axis or in the y axis, you can put the magnetic field, and in the x axis, you can put the chemical potential, which fixes the electron density and the colors represent the Hall conductance. The more reddish it is, or, or darker colors represent positive integers, and the blue color or the light color represents the cold negative integers. So there is some self similarity here in all the same scales, but this can also be transformed into a composite fermion because it essentially explains the tendency of the electron to form bound states with an even number of magnetic uh, flux quanta. So this is nothing but your fractional quantum Hall effect. As I said, it can take integer value, it can also take uh, fractional values on as well. So this is the very phase. This is also very easily understood. The integer quantization of Hall conductance, as I said, was in 1975, but uh, clitzing I, I had a great opportunity to meet him in Korea. So in 1980, he was working with samples which were developed by his colleagues, made an unexpected discovery of all conductivity, which was exactly quantized. You can see those fractional uh, levels. So this uh, gave him the Nobel Prize in 85. So the link between the exact quantization and gauge invariance was subsequently as many of you know, gauge invariance or gauge uh, forces occur in magnetic materials. So this gauge invariance was subsequently found by Robert and uh, most integer quantum all of experiments are now performed on many heterostructures, not only gallium arsenide, there are many heterostructures which are being currently used. I skipped some of these slides because I'm running out of time. So I would like to, this is just to show you that you can spin inject by spin pumping, you can do electrical spin injection, you can do thermal spin injection. And this is one another way of uh, demonstrating that you can use these conceptual ideas not for understanding physics alone. You can also produce relatively very high efficient solar cells because this contribute in a no way known as uh, uh, the excitonic solar cells. I'm not going into the detail, but I just wanted to th throw some light. It is also used in other material systems. I'm just skipping many of them for my time uh, needs. So. This is a wonderful uh, issue of physics today. If some of you have an interest. The Nobel Prizes, for many of your understanding, are not just awarded to one or two people on a, off uh, in a very general way. It goes through a serious process. The Nobel Committee invites experts on uh, given topics to present before this Nobel Committee the highlights of their research or the review of their uh, domain. And in one such uh, review in a Nobel Symposium in 2010, I was believing that Zhang might get the Nobel Prize. He was at Stanford. Unfortunately, or rather uh, good enough, Nobel Prizes are given to real uh, thought provokers or people who contribute in a very serious way. There were other two people, three people. One of them expired about two years or one year ago. Anyway, the idea is 
Nobel symposiums are very important for understanding newer topics. Anthropological insulators and superconductors are connected, which I will show you in uh, the next few slides or try to highlight in one of these slides. So the search for new states of matter continues every time. It is not about uh, a discovery or it is not about any inventions, but trying to understand the physics aspect of it. So that's how things started to happen. The golden age of chemistry, the golden age of particle physics. I'll show you some of the particles which are very seriously or which are uh, important to our discussions also. So in condensed matter is physics, we ask for what are the fundamental states of matter and then we explain solid liquid and gas. We also will explain in terms of the conductivity, metals, insulators, superconductors, magnets, etc. So if there is a broken translational symmetry, if you see this is this crystal structure, and if there is a broken translational symmetry, which I will highlight in one or two of my slides, there is a magnet, there can be a broken rotational symmetry, and if you have a superconductor, there is a broken charge symmetry. This was the famous experiment which uh, Klitsing did in 1980. As you see, this is the demonstration of the fractional uh, quantum Hall effect. I'm not going into the details. As I said, I'll be running out of time. So just remember, this is your quantum Hall effect on your left side, and this is your quantum spin of Hall effect, which was demonstrated in uh, graphene, for example. So this is a topological distinction between a quantum, uh, sorry, a conventional insulator and a quantum spin Hall insulator. This is your conventional insulator. This is my with the accidental surface states, or just call it some surface states. And this is my quantum spin Hall insulator. Okay, so if you see here, if I try to in, uh, clearly understand this uh, red can be an uh, upspin and a blue can be called as, a, sorry, blue can be an upspin and red can be called as a downspin. It's only for conceptual understanding. So you see here the surface states creates such kind of bands or levels within the band gap. And in the QSH or quantum spin hall insulator, you see it can, it's trying to move here. And it, it, uh, there can be an ideal situation where you see here, it is clearly a crisscross or a crossover between two um, levels. This is what you see here. This is my down spin, which is coming down, and this is my blue spin. This could go in this way, or this could come in this way as well. So this is a non-trivial state of matter, and this is a demonstration of what exactly has happened in this one, really, right? This was the earliest investigated material for this understanding. So it produced uh, an uh, STM study as well as ARPS, which is known as angle resolved photoelectron spectroscopy measurements. You see here, with the introduction of uh, N-type doping, this hexagonal spread was made. And so this is a deformation of a surface state. Okay. So th this is the original bismuth telluride, and then they have doped it with uh, uh, an N-type material. So as you see here, it progresses to have this kind of uh, uh, hexagonal deformation of the surface state. This is another simple example. I uh, would like to go in very specific details. Maybe I need a lot of time to understand it. But you can see here, this is the link between the A and this is the link between the B, which means this is the link with respect to the sulfur atoms, and this is the link with respect to the molybdenum atoms. And this keeps happening as A, B, A, B, A, okay? Whereas here, this is obviously an hexagonal structure of molybdenum sulfide. This transforms to a tetragonal structure. And when it transforms, you see here, this becomes as A, B, and C. There is a central atom which contributes to this C. And this is called as a, a hollow center in this case. In the hexagonal case, there is a hollow center. So basically, when I try to glide this S atom or the sulfur atoms in this case, um, obviously, so I'm trying to glide these sulfur atoms, which you can see here, by an unit atomic, uh, by a unit distance equivalent to one lattice value of A plane, 3.16 angstroms. You can very well see this is glided, and this glide makes it from transform from the hexagonal to a tetragonal structure. So if the molybdenum plane glides, on the other hand, it only transforms to a 2H state to a 2H primary state. So there is no real uh, structural transition. This is another classic example of how fundamental physics or fundamental understanding can lead to new conceptual issues or devices as well. So you see here in the molybdenum disulfide, they have put one atom of rhenium, and this has been continuously studied under a transmission electron microscope. And you can see this 1T pushes 
these levels and therefore you see on the either side a different crystalline phases. So this is what is termed as a beta phase and this is termed as an alpha phase. But essentially this 1T has been transformed into different crystal phases or crystalline materials and this transformation can make you derive this as to be a non-semiconductor or a metal semiconductor contact as well. I'm not going to the exact details because it takes a lot of time as I said. So you can see I can create a semiconductor with a 2H and I can create a metal layer on this side. So I can have a metal semiconductor metal device, MSM device for example, by means of this very simple approaches or uh, introducing one atom in a matrix of molybdenum disulfide, which is very curiously interesting or important because these are the two dimensional materials which contributes to what we understand in terms of uh, the topological uh, systems. So now I try to shift gears and I really want to see if there is another five to ten minutes wherein I will just rush through some of my slides because I may not be having enough time. So Uh, I hope I'll be able to see this. Okay. So, I, I wish you all see this. Uh, are you seeing? Hello? Hello? Okay. I assume that many of your mic is muted, so let me continue without uh, feedback. I hope you are seeing this. So, the more standard model of elementary particles are to be understood for this understanding. I'm not going into the specific details of each of these particles, but you can uh, very well uh, say that there is a, a very clear expression in these days about what we call as a Majorana fermion. So, this Majorana fermion is uh, uh, Majorana, as many of you know, it, an Italian physicist who contributed to uh, the neutrino understanding. So this is what you see here. There is a neutrino and this neutrino has very many uh, discussions as we see here in the particles here. So the term is sometimes used in opposition to a Dirac fermion which describes the fermions are that are not their own antiparticles. Whereas a um, uh, Majorana fermion has its own antiparticle. So that's where you have to understand here. Hello. OK, so so the standard uh, model uh, fermions are known to be given as uh, Dirac fermions at very low energy and none are known as iron of fermions. So the nature of this is to be uh, understood and very recently people have seen these iron of fermions and that is where we are trying to work on these kinds of two dimensional materials. So you have as many of you know nanomaterials can be created either by the top down or the uh, bottom up approach. But many of the people nowadays works on uh, both uh, ways. A super lattice can be very easily created by what is known as a top down approach. Um, whereas, sorry, a bottom up approach, whereas the top down approach is very limited into two dimensions. Like what I'm trying to understand. So, we have done uh, the growth of zirconium telluride. We did a lot of earlier works, and currently I'm trying to focus on this zirconium telluride. I may have a backup of, of other things which I will show you based on the time of the Basically, the zirconium slices in very finny forms, as you can see in the next slide, with respect to phase diagram. We have got a nice uh, ZRT5, and uh, this is what you can see here. There are several phases which are possible, like ZR3T, ZR5T, 4ZRT and the ZRT5 orthorhombic, and then you can have ZR 0.67T, 
which is very important to me, but I am not still able to con contribute in this. Uh, we also can end up very easily with ZRT E3, depending on the understanding of this phase diagram and the temperature through which you try to crystallize. This is where crystal growth is important. As I am a crystal grower, I am proud to say that I am working on this problem and I see a lot of challenges in these issues. Uh, there is an anomalous uh, uh, temperature dependence of temperature variation of receivity at 141 Kelvin or so, there is an anomalous variation. That is also one of the serious concerns for many issues around. You can vary the temperature uh, of uh, this anomalous nature by suitably doping it um, with uh, various elements. People have tried all these uh, things also, but I'm trying to understand it from the crystal growth perspective also. So I'm trying to express that crystal growth problem is very serious here, particularly when you want to have a ZRT5 monoclinic or ZRT3 or a ZR0.670. To freeze that at these temperatures, to grow them, you need a very clear understanding. So as I told you, Dirac cones are very important. It's a crisscross point of the electrons, which avoid the energy uh, with respect to the valence and the conduction bands, and they are not equal anywhere in the two-dimensional lattice. This is what you see here. These are the vertices and you can see here there are some six vertices. So these six vertices, one, two, three, four, five, six. So here you can see this is what we call as a Dirac cone. And here this Dirac cone is formed by the what we call as a massless fermion, which leads to various quantum Hall effects as well. So this is what we have to understand. And this can be understood or the presence of this can be uh, captured as an image by means of angle resolved photo emission uh, spectroscopy, uh, which are available only in very few places. And uh, there are various issues connected to this because of time and just trying to avoid. But you can remember there are two terms which are very often used here, which are known as semi-metals and particular veil semi-metal. So we are trying to work on some of this. Uh, some understanding of this. This is what I said. I needed uh, some kind of an uh, this is my topological insulator they are on my left here and this is a normal ordinary insulator. So these are the surface or interface status which can create a massless electron or a Dirac fermion and this is what we call as a Dirac. This midpoint here is called as a Dirac point. So once again we have done some recent work by one of my students on uh, effects of magnetic doping. This is what is known as a time reversal symmetry. So if you have a time reversal symmetry, this would happen like this. It will go up and create a, a perfect reversal. Whereas if you break this time reversal, this is what we call as a time reversal symmetry breaking. And this can be achieved in magnetically doped uh, topological insulators, or you can also use uh, ferromagnetic insulators. And then on top of it, you can have a topological insulator, which will create what we call as a TRS breaking or time reversal symmetry breaking. So uh, this can also be created by the surface states. This is what is all about the all effect once again. So you have a quantum all effect. You have this kind of surface states. And then if you have an anomalous all effect, that means the reversals are on the opposite side. Here, as you see, this is because of the Lorentz force which drives the electrons to move to one side or either sides, and the accumulation creates a potential difference, which you call as a uh, uh, Hall voltage. Here, the applied magnetic field, it can be switched, and you can also try to understand the anomalous Hall effect, and you can once again try to understand the quantum anomalous Hall effect by means of what I described earlier, the fractional states or at very low temperatures, you can study the quantum anomalous Hall effect, and you can also study the spin state of the electron, which is uh, which could be due to the single spin positions, or it could be due to the, uh, the bound, unbound states of the uh, electron, which is known as the edge states. And uh, you can also have a quantum spin all effect, which was discovered in 2007, which can also be studied with respect to the, as I said, the edge states can have a spin up or a spin down conceptually. And so therefore you can study this quantum spin all effect. So this zirconium pentatelluride shows a nearly dissipationless current, a technically important material with strong topological electronic effects. So when they illuminated with the light, they could uh, make the material as if it is twisted. 
So the material crystallite is twisted. This is what I said, breaking the symmetry is what is all about this topological understanding. So you can create by means of various methodologies. So one of the very important methodology is to twist the material, which can create very high speed uh, transfer or charge transfers. And they are insulating in the bulk. This is what has to be could have been defined in any early stage itself. But I thought saw many lectures, so I think by now you know topological insulators are electrically insulating in their bulk, but they can conduct electrical electricity extremely well on the edge states via special electronic states that are protected from fluctuations in their environment. So basically, there is no backscattering is the main dissipating process. And this backscattering doesn't happen in a topological insulators, and that's why it is able to have a near zero dissipation. So this can have a lot of advantages in quantum qubits because of the materials shield the fragile quantum states from impurities and lattice vibrations. So recently in Brookerman, Bang and colleagues found that the electrons in their twisted zirconium telluride uh, state of T5 can travel at very high velocities to the fraction of a uh, light speed or distances last as long as 10 uh, microns, which is very pretty uh, fast and long distance. So the photonic, uh, the so photonic symmetry switching is what is happening here, which has been explained by this theoretical group as well as Weyl fermions are described very early in 1949 itself. But the phononic symmetry switching enables them to control the flow of electrons without using electric or magnetic fields. And this is done in 16th February 2021. These are some of the Redox analysis of my uh, crystals. I have termed it as C1, C2. You can see some oxygen presence here. And similarly, the oxygen presence is relatively high here. We would like to eliminate them. And uh, here in this case also we see some oxygen presence. These are different samples termed as A1 and A2. But the quality of zirconium is good and tellurium content is very close to the expectations. So this is one of the group of samples termed as ZTA, essentially zirconium telluride Te5. And this is also ZR Te5. And these layers such as are very important as a crystal grower to understand how to control and optimize. Many groups have worked on this. I'll show some of the results of the other groups as well. So these are some of the Raman spectral analysis done by my colleague, a student earlier, uh, Dr. Jagannathan from Trinchi. So this matches well with respect to the reported literature values. People have done uh, kind of understanding on the Raman uh, effect with respect to the interpretations which are necessary for uh, understanding this anomalous resistivity at uh, uh, 141 Kelvin. So they try to understand if there is a lattice vibration change or phonon uh, symmetry issues. That is where these Raman studies are very important. As you can see, Raman studies are not just for uh, the understanding of uh, normal materials or molecular materials. You can uh, very seriously contribute to the fundamental understanding as to how the phonon symmetry breakages happen. This is what they have done over a period of time. Uh, they, they have studied this as a function of temperature a long time ago, meaning about 10 in 20 years ago. So these are the two material structures which are uh, uh, very important for me. So I'm trying to project ZRT5, ZRT3, and you can see these are available in this materials project uh, data bank. And this is uh, one of the critical works which was done by a group in China and they have done a, a analysis of these material systems. They have grown it on silicon substrates. I'm trying to grow it on different substrates to understand or eliminate the possible uh, incorporation of uh, the ZRT3. So let me see why, why it stops. They have studied as uh, the width of the sample itself, 20 micron, 0.5 micron. They have studied and they have reported that this has an occurrence of ZRT3 also. So that we have to avoid and uh, I'm trying to, as I said, I'm trying to use different substrates. So they report, uh, we have reports on this ZRT3 as well. This is where we started. Actually, I uh, started explaining some of my work. But we started with respect to the Dussler alloys. I have no time, so I will not go into the details. I just skip all of them. We did this band calculation, so 
I think I have taken a little bit more time. Uh, Mondal, hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, I think I can stop, but uh, the title I gave uh, one more material system which is known as CGT. So, if mm -hmm. you can find another two to three minutes, I will quickly show that. Okay. All right, okay. stop here. Uh, okay, you, you, can, you can take uh, two, three minutes, no problem. Okay. So, this is what I. When you are not in physical presence, <laughs> these are the risks. So, you see here, this is another material system as I started saying CRGT6 and CR2G5 uh, TEA. These are very clearly seen from the X-ray spectra to be with a different formula. And uh, this is also done with the other studies of XPS. And we have done also squid measurements. And this is some detailed studies of XPS uh, in collaboration with one of the very high performance automated XPS. Uh, so the, here, as I said, this is a difficulty with respect to the strong overlap between the Tellurium 3D and the Chromium 2P regions. So we try to do some, or rather the group enabled us to understand very carefully by removing the oxygen which are present by means of cleaning with argon ion cleaning. So they removed a couple of monolayers and then they try to remove the oxygen uh, presence and uh, this is how it has been done. So you see here they have suppressed the oxygen and the carbon one spectra. And uh, after that, they try to understand the presence of Tellurium 2D, 3D and the Chromium 2P spectra. This is what I wanted. Or, uh, we started with this. Uh, I think this is all I have to say. I didn't show the crystals, but you should believe that without the crystals, I cannot present these details. So. I think I will just stop here and thank uh, Dr. Mondal for this wonderful opportunity. And if there are some uh, comments, remarks, I would like to take and then uh, or rather if there are some people who are interested to collaborate, I will be happy to interact also. This is a lot thank of work. Thank you sir, for your sir. nice talk and uh, introductions about the uh, different type of materials and these characterizations, uh, requirement and the future aspects. So I will request to the participants and uh, professors who are present here to ask some questions to Professor J. Kumar. We can quickly take two, three questions. Somebody you have in your mind any questions you can ask to Professor J. Kumar directly now. They can type also if they want or send an email yeah. showed my mail ID in one of the. Yes, sir. So yeah. you can also send the email to Professor Kumar. This is, uh, I don't know if I can share this to show my mail ID. Okay, I think uh, many people have a different view of uh, this entire topic, so. But this is uh, certainly a lot of work and uh, I'm very happy that I had an opportunity to share. This is my mail ID. So any of you who are interested, I have given the mail ID at the bottom. It is MEARSJK at anainu.edu or at gmail.com. So these are the two mail IDs. Okay, Mundal, maybe many Thank people you, are. Thank, Thank you step. for giving. Uh, giving your time. Right, yeah, I'll be yes. in a contact with you. Uh, yes. Okay, yes, yes. Very Thank kind you. of you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, sir. Bye bye. Bye, sir. Bye, sir. So uh, I'll introduce the speaker. So the speaker is Dr. Nilanjan Haldar, uh, is an associate professor in the Department of Physics, Monipal University, Jaipur and joined in the university in the year 2011. He received his PhD from Electronic Science Department, University of Calcutta in the year 2007, and his doctoral results includes epitaxial growth of technologically important 3.5 semiconductor materials. He had an ex extensive five years of postdoctoral research experience in the reputed institutes in India as well as in the abroad. 
to name a few visiting research scholar at University of Nevada, US uh, in 2006 to 2007, Institute postdoctoral fellow at IIT Bombay 2007 to 2009, associate academic staff of Catholic University, Belgium 2010, research scientist at Center of Nanoelectronics, IIT Bombay 2011, Dr. Halder also visited DFG Center for Functional Nanostructures, University of Karlsham, uh, Germany in 2009 and Department of Physics, Lancaster University, UK uh, in 2010 uh, for research academic interactions. Dr. Halder had uh, experience in different aspects of semiconductor growth characterizations and nano devices. He has 40 journal publications and 20 conference paper, uh, conference paper in his schedule. So with these short introductions, I will invite Dr. Halder uh, for his technical lecture. Sir, please. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, Dr. Aniruddha. Thank you for introducing me uh, nicely. Uh, I think I'm audible, right? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. And uh, good afternoon to all of the um, attendees as well as the um, uh, participants. Uh, so let me share uh, my uh, screen. Okay, uh, so I was just uh, I was just going through the lectures. So all of the lectures are related to uh, you know solar cell uh, harvesting of solar energy, uh, low power devices, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, for uh, sustainability, sustainable uh, environment or sustainability. Uh, although I uh, used to work uh, in that field, I had experience in those fields. So presently, I am um, working um, with wet precipitation process, and maybe I am developing my lab. So uh, maybe uh, within a few days, we'll be uh, doing those uh, in those uh, directions. But what I used, I will be uh, introducing today, is that. Uh, you see that with a low cost, very low cost uh, methods, we can amount to the sustainable uh, uh, environment. And uh, low cost wet precipitation method, we can create some nanostructures uh, which will amount to the environmental sustainability. So the title of my talk is Impact of the Synthesis Condition on the Crystallization Process of a Magnesium Hydroxide Synthesis via Wet Precipitation Route. So anyway, uh, what we will discuss, I will discuss again the magnesium hydroxide for um, um, environmental sustainability, how the nano ceramic uh, hydroxides can be used for a sustainable environment and uh, then what i will do i will uh, discuss uh, some of the uh, precipitation or co-precipitation methods of uh, producing magnesium hydroxide in uh, mild condition means in very uh, very low cost condition and then secondly what i will do i will discuss some of my work or main my recent work related to this uh, system magnesium hydroxide system um, uh, where I did the explore morphology exploration of the control of the morphology of the magnesium hydroxide by um, by time dependent variation of uh, pH uh, of the reaction mixture uh, and uh, we I have done some uh, detailed physical and optical analysis of the structures and finally I have proposed I will be proposing a model uh, that how the structures are being uh, how those structures, uh, how we can control uh, the, uh, the morphology of this magnesium hydroxide. We can tune the morphology of the magnesium uh, hydroxide, okay, uh, using, um, um, using uh, 
using uh, the synthesis condition or synthesis parameters. And finally, I will conclude my talk. So uh, anyway, my application of magnesium hydroxide, as I told that uh, magnesium hydroxide can be uh, synthesized in diverse morphology uh, from needles, platelets, rods, flares to flowers and stars. So uh, this kind of diverse uh, morphology or nanostructuring help this material in creating many avenues in advanced research. Uh, because as we know that in uh, nanostructured material, the porosity, surface area, or the presence of uh, some active sites, those matters, and that actually is responsible for its diverse application. And the, uh, what are the important application for environmental sustainability, the important application of magnesium hydroxide for in environmental sustainability are, it can be used as um, carbon dioxide as absorber and absorber of toxic waste from water. So uh, here there is an example that, uh, you know, that uh, where they, what, what, what the deed is that uh, they have, you know, use this uh, magnesium hydroxide, nanostructured magnesium hydroxide for carbon dioxide absorber. So carbon dioxide can uh, act as a soft acid and uh, magnesium hydroxide can act as a soft base. So you see here that uh, the carbon uh, gets linked with this uh, negative charge, um, which is centered around this oxygen and the weak interaction, weak van der Waal interaction uh, develops. And when this carbon dioxide is passed through this um, um, nanostructured uh, magnesium hydroxide, it will get ad absorbed in its surface and then uh, we will be getting a pure uh, air, okay? So uh, the, this kind of, uh, you know, um, absorbers can be uh, developed um, through this, uh, with the help of this magnesium hydroxide. Another, uh, as I discussed, another um, use of magnesium hydroxide for uh, sustainable environment is, uh, you know, uh, ab absorption of toxic waste from water. So again, what they did, uh, this is again uh, a clip from a paper, what they did is that um, they, uh, they, they, they have taken the nano magnesium hydroxide and uh, put some uh, wastewater containing lead ions and uh, the lead uh, gets immobile, immobilized with, uh, over the active sites uh, on this uh, nanostructured magnesium hydroxide. And then uh, what they did is they uh, passed carbon dioxide and uh, there is a uh, carbon dioxide induced phase change. So we'll be getting lead carbonate and magnesium hydrocarbonate, which is a solution. And then we calcine this magnesium hydrocarbonate uh, uh, to again regenerate the nano magnesium hydroxide. And we will be getting the lead as a, um, um, as a lead carbonate particle and uh, the output will be the purified water. So uh, this is again a, um, you know, use of uh, magnesium hydroxide for uh, environmental uh, sustainability. Um, so now uh, what we do here is that how the magnesium hydroxide is prepared. It is a very simple process. We take the uh, pre magnesium precursor, maybe magnesium nitrite, magnesium chloride, chlor sorry, chloride, magnesium sulfate, and I put nano and um, I put uh, sodium hydroxide and I uh, star the solution and uh, the parameters to control. Uh, the reaction kinetics are, uh, you see here, the rate of addition of NaOH, uh, the solvent temperature, solvent starting speed. And uh, since this kind of precipitation reactions are very fast, so uh, you see the surfactants actually matters in controlling the morphology of the magnesium hydroxide. So... <coughs> So the the uh, the mag preparation of magnesium hydroxide uh, um, um, uh, is a um, using uh, this kind of um, uh, this kind of sol solution based process is a very inexpensive process and it takes place in mild condition 
and uh, what uh, I myself did in my lab, um, what I did is that I took uh, magnesium nitrate and I add magnesium sodium hydroxide and uh, you see here that uh, we'll be getting a powdery precipitate and the precipitate is being uh, annealed uh, for uh, around 775 degrees centigrade and uh, we will get we will be getting uh, you will get this kind of um, um, nano flowers or petals or intertwined porous nanostructures and um, what I did that I um, I, I, I um, took the XRD and uh, from the XRD I can measure the uh, we can we have measured the um, um, the, the particle size and you see the different um, so uh, with the different precursors okay um, um, this is from magnesium chloride and this is from magnesium nitrate the B uh, is from magnesium nitrate the particle size depends and the strain the structure strain also uh, varies okay uh, so uh, naturally their adsorption capability or uh, you know uh, the adsorption of uh, the, um, mineral, the, the minerals from the toxic water or the carbon dioxide those capabilities will vary and um, um, so uh, the thing is that um, uh, what happens here is simply a precipitation reaction that a solution is a thermodynamic equilibrium process and uh, when you uh, put uh, this uh, uh, when you want to precipitate then what you have to do you have to uh, generate a uh, non-equilibrium state so uh, what will happen the solute will get precipitated and the non-equilibrium -non state means that uh, you have to put excess or you have to make the solute concentration of the solute in excess so that it gets precipitated and this can be done by heating the solution or by changing the um, uh, somehow by uh, stirring uh, or those things by heating the solution is one way to uh, to induce the precipitation reaction and different uh, magnesium precursors have different um, will be giving different nano structures because you see that uh, when the precipitate forms there will be a crystal solution interface and uh, with the um, uh, with the different salts or with the different magnesium pre precursor the interfacial surface tension will change and uh, we'll be getting a nanostructures of different um, of uh, different uh, morphology or different uh, physical characteristics so uh, here uh, some uh, this paper has given that why uh, how this uh, kind of uh, intertwined nanopetal assembly is formed so initially there will be uh, the primary nanocrystals uh, due to the nucleation and then they will form the nanosheets and the nanosheets will generally um, uh, with the uh, with the passing of the time it will get intertwined and it will form this nanopetal assembly so uh, so uh, the thing is that uh, that by that that what can be um, what message can be taken is that by changing the uh, the reaction condition or changing the uh, parameters we can form nano different morphologies of the nano um, um, magnesium hydroxide and let me just introduce you uh, that um, what the structure of the magnesium hydroxide. Uh, so uh, this is the crystal structure of the mag magnetic magnesium hydroxide. It forms in layers and uh, this is one layer of magnesium hydroxide and this is a one planar layer of magnesium hydroxide. And uh, they used to uh, get attached one by one along the c-axis that is 001 direction okay this one is the uh, c-axis and uh, this one is the 001 direction the uh, direction is being the vertical vertical arrow okay uh, so uh, they used to get attached with the hydrogen bonding okay so uh, the uh, due to this hydrogen bonding so these layers are uh, very flexible they can move one over another so um, this uh, due to this hydrogen bonding they for that that actually um, um, that actually uh, make the layers uh, together 
so uh, this is a structure of the magnesium hydroxide and uh, sometimes the magnesium hydroxide can be synthesized in uh, platelets in the form of nanoplatelets as i told that uh, in this case that you see here the um, the, um, the the nucleation uh, nucleation sites are there then the nanoplatelets will be formed then they will form nano sheets and the nano sheets will intertwine uh, to form the nanopetal assembly so uh, in this case, uh, the nanoplatelets, uh, you see here, the nanoplatelets, the direction will be, uh, the, the direction, the planar, the planar lamellar direction will be uh, along 001, and the edge planes will be in the, uh, um, in the 110 and uh, 101, okay? So, uh, 001 is the lamellar direction, and the edge planes will be 110 and 101. So uh, uh, let us see uh, what we did in our lab is that we have taken uh, um, aqueous solution of magnesium nitrate, okay, and this molarity is fixed uh, 0 0.5 molar, okay, and uh, we um, equal volume of uh, magnesium nitrate solution and equal volume of we used to uh, equal volume of sodium hydroxide and we add the sodium hydroxide dropwise and we change the molarity of the sodium hydroxide, okay? It is 0.5 molar, 1 molar, 1.5 molar, and 2 molar, okay? Uh, so, uh, and uh, the thing is that uh, this has been con added dropwise and at a fixed uh, rate, okay? We means we, uh, the rate is being fixed. And uh, what happens? Hello? Hello? Somebody is talking, uh, please. Mute your mic. Yeah, someone, someone's mic is. Please, uh, everybody, mute your mic first. Okay. 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 Now Shall I continue? Yeah. 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 So, dropwise, uh, we add the magnesium uh, hydro sodium hydroxide over the magnesium uh, nitrate solution, and the addition rate is, uh, you know, maintained, and the entire uh, solution is being added at a fixed time, twenty minutes. And we starred it and uh, we uh, kept the solution at 50 degrees centigrade. We uh, press the precipitate we have we will form and uh, we collected the precipitate. We filtered the precipitate and we dry the precipitate and we'll be getting, we, we got the magnesium hydroxide nanoparticles. So uh, this is just uh, a, uh, we will be uh, using this table um, um, very frequently in, uh, in my lecture. So what we have done, what we, I have shown here is that um, the, uh, so the S1, S2, S3, S4 are the samples. Uh, S1 is being formed by 0 0.5 molar sodium hydroxide. This one is one molar, S3 is 1.5 molar and S4 is two molar and we have, maintain the pH, we have, we have uh, calculated the pH after every equal uh, volume of addition of sodium hydroxide. So if we have 40 milliliter, we have maintained the pH of the solution, 80 milliliter maintained the, um, we have uh, measured the pH, then 120 milliliter addition, we have measured the pH, 150 milliliter, we have measured the pH. And here we have um, measured the pH in 25, 50, 75, 100. Now, uh, one, is, uh, one thing is that here we have taken a, um, you know, a larger volume of magnesium nitrate and magnesium uh, sodium hydroxide, 150 milliliter, because in this case, the yield for the sample S1, the yield of the uh, precipitate is a bit less. So that's why we have taken, uh, and, uh, we have increased the volume of the reactants taken. But, uh, you know, the volume of sodium hydroxide and the magnesium nitrate, okay, uh, remains the same, okay. Uh, so now, what we did here, um, so what we can, what we are seeing here that we have induced a temporal variation of time dependent variation of pH of in the reaction mixture, isn't it? So, what we may did is that a temporal variation of pH of the reaction mixture is maintained during the entire precipitation process that is actually the 20 minute. So now let us see what happened, what we got. We got uh, the samples S1, S2, S3, S4. As I told that S1 is for 0.5, 1, 1.5 and 2. 
and you see here for S1, I got the uh, I got the nano rod kind of structures, and for uh, S2, S3, and S4, I got the platelet kind of structure. Okay, and now what we do, what we did is that uh, this is the um, ED, EDS spect spectra, and uh, the EDS spectra um, is showing that we have only magnesium and uh, oxygen in the in large number. So uh, the system is actually the magnesium hydroxide. So uh, now we, we characterize these samples. So let us see what we did. We did the XRD. And what I'm seeing here is that for the sample S1, which is A, okay, S1, A is always S1, B is S2, C is S3, and S4, uh, D is the S4. So um, the, 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 crystal, the crystal structure or the crystallographic uh, orientations are very poor um, but, and that is being improved in B and C is the best sample and um, uh, again uh, after C again the, the crystal orientation gets degraded okay as per the uh, you know intensity of the um, um, XRD plots. So what I did here is that I, um, I um, measured the intensity ratio, okay? So uh, intensity along I001 plane and the diagonal one diagonal plane I101 and intensity along 1001 plane and the diagonal plane 110. What we are seeing here is that, you know, that S3, okay, for the sample S3, this has the orientation towards the you know, this plane one I001 because uh, you see the ratio is maximum for the S3, okay? So uh, this S3 is the, 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 the S3 is the more planar or the platelets are more lamellar as compared to S2 and S4 as well as S1. And S1 we have already seen here that it is having a 1D structure. So now, uh, as I told, as I discussed that uh, earlier, that you see the uh, what I did is that uh, we have measured the uh, shader uh, shader length and uh, the through, through the shader equation, and uh, you see here 001 actually gives the uh, thickness of the nanostructure, and uh, um, 110 is actually along this D, which is actually the diagonal. Um, length or the uh, you know radius of the uh, lamellar platelets so what we are seeing here again that you see uh, s2 and s3 the the, the 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 platelets are more lamellar okay as and uh, uh, and what happens here that s1 you see s1 uh, uh, um, which is having the 0, 1, 0, 0, 1 direction 5.79 and if you measure through the FESM, Okay, it is much longer. The nano rods are much longer. So uh, this is this is because uh, you know there is a aggregation of there is a aggregation of you know the microcrystals uh, formed during nanocrystals uh, formed in the S1. So we will again uh, discuss these things uh, late in the next slides. So uh, what I uh, I can conclude here that S3 has a more lamellar structure, and this we have achieved. We have controlled the morphology or the lamellar morphology uh, simply by uh, changing the uh, um, by changing the um, um, by varying the uh, pH of the reaction mixture, um, uh, temporal uh, variation of the pH of the reaction mixture. Now again, we have determined, we have done some refine ret refinements of the uh, XRD plot. And what we did is why, what we formed the, we found the volume uh, of the unit cell. And we again see here that S3, the volume is large, okay? So uh, the morphology is large, okay, as compared to the other uh, cells, other um, samples. And uh, S1, uh, uh, also we can conclude here in S1, you know, there is a compaction of the volume along the C-axis, okay? So you see that is uh, 4.73, and in this case, this is 4.76, 4.77. So S1, there is a compaction uh, of, a, of the um, volume along the C-axis. So now, uh, <coughs> there is a compaction of the volume along the C-axis. And also, we can see here that 
as I um, as I uh, increase um, the um, as I uh, go from um, you know uh, S1, S2, S3, there is a monotonous increase in the C uh, uh, the C axis uh, unit cell length, and then in S4 it is getting decreased. Okay, uh, and it follows the volume also follows the same trend. So now let's see what we did is that we started uh, finding the um, strain in the sample. Uh, so uh, as you know that, um, you know, we, we use the WH William, Williamson Hall um, analysis or plot. Uh, so Scherer equation actually um, considers the broadening of the diffraction uh, peak, okay, due to crystallized, crystallized site. Whereas in Williamson Hall analysis, they considered that this model considers the crystallized site um, change or uh, the broadening uh, actually uh, due to the crystallized site change as well as the micro strain effect in the structure. Okay, so um, this is a uh, this is a well known uh, Williamson Hall uh, equation. This is this is used mainly for um, particles as well as in uh, layers as well, thin films as well. So, uh, and uh, the one thing here that this model considers that uh, it, is, it, is, it is called a uniform distortion model because uh, it considers uniform distortion of the crystalline strain in all directions. So now uh, what we do here is that, uh, uh, that we, uh, we, plot, we, we, um, we use the XRD data Okay, and we fit the, uh, the data uh, using this equation. And uh, you see here that the uh, slope, the slope actually gives the uh, TWH. Okay, the slope of this equation actually gives the, um, 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 uh, uh, sorry, uh, the, uh, the slope of this equation, uh, this FSA, FSA, this actually gives the uh, strain and uh, this y intercept actually will be giving the, um, uh, the, the y intercept will be giving the, uh, the, the particle size. Okay, so uh, these are the plots uh, we generated from the uh, XRD data, and you see here that uh, uh, these are called the trend lines. And it is from these trend lines, you can, uh, you can actually, as I told, that the slope determines the strain. Okay. And negative slope determines the compressive strain, and positive slope determines the um, um, the tensile strain. So, uh, if this strain line will show that uh, what what are the strain inside this uh, those uh, nanostructures, and you see here that for S1, A is B is for S2, and C is for S3, and you see that uh, the uh, straight line is bit straight as compared to the other. Uh, trend lines. Okay, so uh, we can say that the S3 sample is, you know, uh, the S3 sample uh, is more lamellar as well as, you know, the strain inside those samples are less and hence that is the best suitable for uh, those uh, adsorption experiments. So now uh, uh, what I did is that I, um, I uh, calculated the strain. The strain came out to be uh, this one for 0.5 molar uh, is 1.0 uh, molar, this one. And uh, you see here, the less strain is for S3. And again, uh, for S4, the strain uh, is increased. And uh, these are again the uh, particle size as calculated from the Williamson synthesis plot. And uh, you see here, as I mentioned, that uh, this is again following the device Scherer e e um, equation or the particle size we have calculated from the device Scherer. So anyway, um, uh, um, there is big deviations, and those deviations may be due to those uh, strains, which is well uh, well um, um, stated in the uh, Williamson Hall uh, theory. So uh, what I am doing here that we measure the band gaps of these samples. Uh, so uh, and uh, the band gaps are being the talk. This is the talk plot, and the band gaps are in this case. You see the band gaps are plotted. Okay, uh, the band gaps are plotted uh, with respect to strain. And in this picture, the band gap is plotted with respect to the C axis variation. Okay, so uh, from these two pictures, what we can, what we, we, what we can uh, you know, conclude that the 
change in the band gap. So the band gap for the particle, uh, as I told that the sample is the best quality sample, the S3, and you see it is having an enhanced band gap. And uh, uh, so the uh, what we can say that the changed band gap in the particle. So this side is, uh, we are um, in the right hand side, we are uh, showing the band gap. And uh, in the left hand side, we are showing the tra strain in the first picture. In the second picture, again, in the left hand side, we are showing the band gap. And the uh, right hand side, we are showing the C axis lattice constant. So we can conclude that the band gap is actually, you know, uh, the band gap is actually uh, changing uh, due to strain rather than the nanoparticle effect, right? It is uh, following the strain. Uh, and uh, in this case also, uh, and also we can say that since uh, the band gap is following the C axis lattice constant, um, uh, lattice constant length, so uh, this uh, strain is actually along the soft axis C axis, uh, which, which is actually the soft axis of the uh, magnesium hydroxide, because along that axis only the layers, um, layers uh, stack one upon another. Um, um, through hydrogen bonding. And we did some FTR analysis as well as uh, we did some uh, 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 thermogravimetric analysis. Thermogravimetric analysis means uh, we heat the sample from temperature 0 to 800 degrees centigrade. And uh, you see here uh, for uh, um, 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 the magnesium change, magnesium hydroxide changes into magnesium oxide, okay, in this range to 50 to 425 degree centigrade. And uh, you see here uh, this, uh, this drastic fall, this fall actually signifies the phase change that magnesium hydroxide is converted into magnesium oxide. And uh, what we can, what we are seeing here that this fall is very drastic in 0 0.5 molar. And uh, this is because the nanostructure, because this one is a 1D nanostructure, the 0.5 molar platelets are 1, are 1D nanostructure as compared to the 1.0 and 2.0 molar platelets. Um, um, so uh, uh, with this, what we did is that we now, uh, I will propose, or we proposed a, um, uh, a model uh, related to this uh, nano, uh, to mod model, to, uh, to uh, we proposed a model, phenomenological model, to, uh, uh, to describe this uh, change in morphology due to um, temporal variation of pH. So uh, this is the graph which shows the aggregative, uh, which determine, which shows the aggregative nanocrystal growth. Uh, let me just uh, describe one thing. This graph, okay. What happens initially that once you uh, in a reactive crystallization process, okay, the, when you when you start putting the reagents uh, together, so initially there will be the nucleation of the primary crystals. And then the nucleation, the crystals will uh, aggregate, and uh, this step to the nuclear, the, the crystals will aggregate and coalesce, and then it will be, uh, it will start growing. That is called. Uh, there is several uh, kind of name. One is Oswald ripening, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, uh, so uh, growing means what will happen? There is a diffusion of the material from the reaction mixture towards the boundary of these uh, crystals. Okay, so uh, and then uh, step four, there will be a first growth of the nanocrystals. Okay, so this is a in general the aggregative uh, nanocrystal growth. This describes the aggregative nanocrystal growth in a precipitation process. One thing I want to mention here that uh, you know that uh, in the step three and the step four, the the diffusion when there is uh, initially the Crystals will be formed in step one, the primary small crystals, then they will aggregate. And then step three and step four, these this, uh, steps are very fast. There will be a fast diffusion of the particles, okay? At the um, first diffusion of the, um, you can say rather part of the ions uh, at the boundary of this uh, initially formed crystals, okay? So we have to replenish the ions Okay, at, at the faster rate in step three and step four rather than in step one and step two. So in step one and step two, uh, okay, the 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 the, um, the precipitation reaction the the precipitation reaction rate is a bit slow. So what happens here that we uh, we do not require uh, the ions that much. Okay, 
so um, so and there are some some terms um, related to this aggregative nanocrystal growth one is the supersaturation supersaturation means that what how is the, what is the concentration of the magnesium or hydroxide ions magnesium ions comes from magnesium nitride and hydroxide ions comes from sodium hydroxide in our reaction mixture and induction period for precipitation means how fast this primary nine nanocrystals precipitates okay this is the step one nucleation happens okay so how far fast the primary nanocrystal precipitates that is called the induction period so um, and also uh, we I, I need to point out here that surface energy along the 001 plane means the soft c axis okay uh, that is low as compared to the diagonal planes that is 101 and 110 in uh, magnesium hydroxide so uh, what happens here that um, so um, so um, that uh, compact because the non polar 110 sorry 001 uh, crystal plane in magnesium hydroxide is compact in nature as compared to the diagonal planes okay so uh, the diagonal planes that is 101 and 110 are uh, much more uh, uh, energetic or the surface energy is very high so the uh, the the, the uh, ions will try to migrate to those planes okay uh, as uh, as i start putting the ions in the reaction mixture okay so let us see what happens here that for the sample one okay since i have maintained you see in the right hand side since i have maintained a low super saturation so the ph actually uh, the ph of the solution actually determines the super saturation or the concentration of the ions okay since i have maintained a low super saturation so what happens here the nucleated primary crystals will find okay very uh, so uh, will find uh, uh, will 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 aggregate towards the c axis rather than they grow rather than growing along the edge wise planes okay so that's why what we are doing what we are getting we are getting this column like structure okay the stack the, the they stack one upon another the nucleated crystallites stack upon one another along this 001 plane and we are getting this columnar nanostructure uh, oriented nanostructure now in case of sample uh, s uh, sorry s um, uh, this will be s2 and s3 what is happening since initially when the nucleation happens okay the primary nanocrystals form okay we have maintained a very low super saturation okay and as we go uh, to the um, uh, to the uh, you know end process okay uh, end of the crystallization process okay the super saturation is increased the ph is increased uh, you can see from this um, um, this uh, ph uh, table so uh, what is happening that the primary nanocrystals after being formed okay it once it is formed it will as the super saturation is increased at the latter stage okay so a driving pro force will be created and that driving force actually um, um, actually drives the uh, ions uh, available in the reaction mixture towards those edge wise planes and uh, will be having the uh, in the good uh, nano platelets and uh, and uh, since the um, the super saturation is maximum uh, for at the and latter stage in s3 so we got the s3 samples more um, uh, means uh, unstrained so the strain is less the crystal structure is less the optical properties are very good so we got very good samples in case of s3 that is uh, when we work with the 1.5 molar noh noh and the samples are having good 2D lamellar morphology. Now in the sample S4, so what we are doing is uh, here we have we have we are using 2.0 molar nan NaOH, and the magnesium nitrite again uh, the concentration is 0.5 molar. So in this case, what happens? You see that uh, you see that after addition of 50 milliliter of NaOH, the pH increased to 11.4. So since the pH uh, increased 
uh, drastically as compared to the other samples at, at this stage, okay? So what will happen? There will be a brust nucleation, the nuclear, the particles will be, uh, the, the, uh, the, the primary nanoparticles will be formed at a rapid rate. And then uh, what will happen? There will be a movement diffusion of the, uh, uh, of the ions towards those particles. And we, uh, we got, uh, you know, relatively, so as I, as I, we have seen that um, for the sample S4, the quality is degraded as compared to the S3. So the part we got relatively smaller size nanocrystals and the nanocrystals are coarse. Okay, so uh, this is the, um, you can say that uh, the, this is the end of my talk. Uh, so uh, the entire work is being published in a good paper, Advanced uh, Powder Technology. Um, uh, so uh, I uh, hereby conclude uh, my talk. Uh, so uh, what we have discussed here that uh, we have discussed that efficacy of magnesium hydroxide for different applications due to the shape and morphology of nanostructures, and that can be controlled by judicious choice of reactants as well as reagent concentration uh, through uh, facile uh, pre precipitation process. Uh, I have done a systematic study. We have discussed a systematic study to explore the morphology um, uh, control of the magnesium hydroxide precipitates by temporal variation of uh, pH, temporal pH variation of the reaction mixture. And we have de de done a detailed characterization of the uh, precipitated magnesium hydroxide. And uh, we uh, got to know that the change in super saturation and induction period, okay, which is being uh, which is being uh, controlled uh, by the different molarity of NaOH that actually maintains or that actually controls the nanostructure morphology and a model is being proposed and what we uh, can say that this is a very uh, inexpensive process and such kind of controlled growth and nucleation of magnesium hydroxide morphology presents a great scope of potential of application of this material for environmental sustainability. So uh, with this, I end my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Okay. So uh, <clears throat> thank you for your nice talk and uh, very good uh, explanations and detailed explanations of, uh, regarding the magnesium hydroxide uh, with a very um, uh, low cost technique and uh, i must suggest to the uh, uh, to the participant that you can follow this process for the other uh, materials growth also uh, and which will be uh, uh, user friendly as well as uh, user friendly for the environment so, uh, participant, if you have any questions, you can ask to uh, Dr. Nilanjan Haldar um, now itself, please. Okay, so you do not have any questions, then you must contact to in London, Halder, yeah, is a very uh, simple process. So yeah. anyone mm -hmm. can um, do this. Anyway, let me introduce the second speaker, eminent uh, speaker uh, of our webinar, international web. And uh, he is basically the professor of IIT BHU of Electronics and Communication Engineering Department. So, Professor Chakravarti, uh, having this uh, research area on the design and development of the mid infrared optical source and detectors, fabrications and characterizations of nano electronics and nano photonics devices based on the low cost material fabrications and characterizations of the flexible electronics and photonics component based on the organic polymers. So he has uh, many awards. So uh, he has awarded in Engineering and Physical Science Research Council, UK Senior Visiting Fellowship uh, for the year 2003. So uh, uh, a science academy visiting fellow in the year 1994 science and engineering research council visiting fellowship dst uh, in the year of 1993 mr si distinguished 
lectureship award uh, in the year 2019 and amiti academic excellence award in the year 2015 he has several patents on a surface uh, surface disintegration system uh, and the microfabrications annealing furnace with integrated magnetic field and electric field applications and affixable uh, hall measurement setup and electrochemical process of immunobased th uh, thermoionic based nano silica And he is a member of the uh, Associate Editor Journal of Electronics Mater uh, Materials Springer, member of Materials Research Society of India, life member of Indian Society of Technical Educations, and member of Optical Society of India, senior member of ITPL INC USA, fellow the Institute of Engineers India. And he has journal publications more than 172 and he also published conference paper more than 150 he edited eight books so with this very short introductions i will invite to professor uh, uh, professor p chakraborty for his technical talk sir please thank you dr mondal <clears throat> and the uh, introduction was quite lengthy because you know that I have another lecture scheduled from six o'clock. So I'll be able to just spend probably half an hour or so. Uh, let me at the onset uh, thank the organizer and particularly Dr. Mondal for inviting me to uh, deliver this lecture in the webinar. And today I'll be talking on organic semiconductors for flexible electronics is one of the uh, trust areas of research uh, in our team uh, and most of the research we have carried out at IIT BHU in collaboration with some other labs uh, and I'll quickly go through the basic uh, basics of this organic semiconductors and their use in general and then I'll talk about our contribution in the area. So. The outline of the talk, I'll give a preamble of this and brief history of the evolution of organic semiconductors, the charge carrier dynamics in uh, semiconducting polymers, flexible organic materials and their applications, and few organic TFT prototypes developed uh, for sensing application in our laboratory, and some new generation material, future potential and challenges, and then we'll conclude. So as you know that materials, that new generation materials have revolutionized this growth of electronics. Uh, there was a time when we were dependent on a number of materials only. Uh, and we used to design our devices and system based on the materials available to us. But today we are in the age when we can design the material. We can tailor the properties of the materials the way we wish. And that's a big advantage. And this flexibility gives us enormous scope for developing new devices and systems. For example, we are looking for a day when your mobile will look something like this shown in this uh, diagram where you can fold this mobile just like a piece of paper and put it in your pocket. So, so this kind of flexibility, stretchability of electronic circuit you know, is not impossible now. It's possible. And, we are heading towards that. And thanks to this new generation organic semiconductor materials, which would make it possible. So these are some of the examples of uh, wearables which are made of organic semiconductors. So these are some of the examples how you must have seen in the airports and other places, the large area display units, which, are, which can be bent, the cylindrical, circular, spherical, so whatever way you want, you can uh, have this kind of display today. And uh, again, it is because of these organic semiconductors, which are flexible. 
So these are some uh, detailed uh, example of these flexible image sensors. Uh, then we have flexible variables, which I've shown that uh, this could be uh, your uh, things which can monitor the health parameters of a person also, which you can wear like uh, watch. And then you can have an uh, LG has come out with a television of 65 inch uh, TV that can be rolled and put on the back seat of your car when you're traveling and then you can stretch it again and watch the program there. So you have flexible smart card, you have electronic tattoos, which can monitor your glucose, right? There's self healing electronic gel. So electronic circuits, this gel can be used to uh, fix the problems in electronic circuits. There's electronic gloves, which will be uh, which will have this sensitivity like uh, human human hands, fingers, touch sensitivity, all these things you can have by using this semiconductor. Let us, let us quickly go through this uh, classification of these um, uh, materials which we have. As you know that the conductors are highly conductive and uh, resistivity is very, very low. So they have low resistance, so they allow the current to flow easily and resistivity is of the order of 10 to the power minus 2 to 10 to the power minus 8 ohm meter. Insulators, you know that they have very high resistivity or very high resistance. They do not allow this current to flow easily. But semiconductor has a resistivity or a conductivity in between the conductors and insulator. One may wonder that why, why, since we are dealing with all current, then why one should not be interested to have this highest conductivity, rather why you should uh, look for materials where the conductivity is in between insulator and conductor. The reason is that semiconductor gives you the opportunity to modulate its conductivity in number of ways and in the way it can give you a large number of devices where you can control the characteristics like say current voltage characteristics, capacitance voltage characteristics, a lot of parameters you can change just by modulating the conductivity and that, that's the beauty of semiconductor and they are widely used uh, for making a lot of devices. And you must be aware of the other kind of material, which is superconductor. One point of time, it showed a lot, lot of promises and people thought that probably superconductors are going to replace the semiconductor, but that didn't really happen. And uh, semiconductors still dominate this electronics uh, world even today. So these materials, uh, we normally, semiconductor materials, uh, when you st start studying about semiconductors, uh, you mostly focus on rigid semiconductors, semiconductors which, which cannot be bent. These are hard materials, right? And elemental semiconductors, you know that germanium and silicon, which belong to group four of this periodic table, they're indirect band gap materials. And germanium has a band gap of around 0.66 electron volt and silicon has 1.12 electron volt at room temperature. And um, you know that even today, silicon rules the semiconductor industry even today. Uh, but there are a lot of other materials which, which uh, give uh, possess challenge before silicon because silicon being an indirect band gap semiconductor cannot be used uh, as optical sources. That is one of the major drawback of silicon. Uh, and even though today's IC uh, integrated circuit, uh, this all this IC manufacturing is primarily based on this silicon. So you have a, another group of materials which are called compound semiconductors or alloy semiconductors. Uh, there you can have materials like gallium arsenide, indium arsenide, indium antimonide, gallium phosphide, gallium nitride, indium nitride, and a host of such materials are possible where you combine an element of group three to a group five. And they have uh, this crystalline structure and they give you uh, the semiconducting properties. And these materials are very, very flexible in a way that you can add some more elements to this, uh, like in gallium arsenide, if you add aluminum, you can get a ternary semiconductor aluminum gallium arsenide. And by changing the percentage of aluminum, you can vary this band gap. In fact, all the characteristics of gallium arsenide can be tailored by adding another group three or a group five element in this material. Like in gallium arsenide, if you add phosphorus, it will give you gallium arsenide phosphide. And changing the percentage of phosphorus, you can have 
the properties of the material can be tailored. One of the important property will be the band gap. And as you know that in uh, optoelectronics application, the wavelength of the light we deal with has a direct relationship with the band gap of the material. So whether you design an optical source or an optical detector, band gap is a useful parameter. So in a way, by changing the composition of the material, you can tune the band gap to respond to certain wavelength regions of light. So this way you can have two, six uh, materials, uh, cadmium selenide, zinc sulfide, zinc oxide. This is oxide group of materials is a separate group of materials. So all these materials can are used actually for making a lot of devices. In addition, you have uh, four, four compounds like uh, silica, silicon carbide, which is another indirect band gap semiconductor. It's a large band gap. Uh, primarily used. This you all know that these are the different materials which are used. Today I'll be talking about a material which is a uh, little different from this uh, semiconductor materials which you know as rigid materials and they are inorganic semiconductors. And as you know the classification of the direct and indirect band gap semiconductor when you go to the momentum space and try to draw the energy band diagram the reciprocal lattice when you consider it. And you find that the EK diagram, energy versus momentum vector, if you draw, you find that the minimum of the conduction band and the maximum top of the valence band, they are not occurring at the same value of K. They give indirect band gap semiconductor, where the transitions are mostly phonon assisted. Whereas in direct band gap semiconductor, there's a band to band transition, momentum is conserved. So this is all we know about the semiconductor. Organic semiconductors, if you a brief history of this organic semiconductor. In 1960s, the first studies of the dark and the photoconductivity of anthracene crystal and organic semiconductor was reported. But people didn't pay much attention to that. But the synthesis and controlled doping of semiconducting polymer was demonstrated by Sirakawa in Tokyo Institute of Technology, for which he was awarded Nobel Prize in 2000. And in 80s onwards, people started taking, uh, late 70s, they started taking seriously these organic semiconductors, probably an alternative material uh, for these inorganic semiconductors. So organic semiconducting polymers like polyaniline, polythiophenine, PPV, PFO, polyacetylene, polypyrrole, polyenzole, polycarbazole, etc., were studied by the researcher. And they made a number of devices uh, to see that whether they can perform with their inorganic counterpart or not. There are two major classes of organic materials. One is the low molecular weight material, or other is conjugated polymers, right? So this low molecular weight materials can be grown by film deposited by sublimation and also deposited by evaporation. Conjugated polymers, the film deposited normally through a chemical route, which is solgen or electrochemical process. So in our lab, we have used this, both these techniques of uh, sol gel as well as electrochemical deposition for uh, depositing the film of organic semiconductors, right? So molecular structure, I'm not a chemist or not a material scientist. So this is the chemical structure of a commonly, commonly used uh, organic semiconductors, right? And if you go by this, uh, why this they show this uh, semiconducting property. So all organic semiconductors, both the um, uh, low molecular weight as well as the contributed polymers, the sp2 hybridization. You know that that is the reason for the band gap which is created in semiconductor. So and this there are molecular orbitals which are created. You know that and. Um, in an isolated molecule and when it comes into a molecular crystal uh, kind of thing, then you know that uh, if you go by quantum mechanical analysis, the uh, wave functions, uh, you can make a linear combination of this wave function and can find the energy band corresponding to this. So molecular orbital theory deals with the combination of atomic orbitals. And when two atoms with the same energy are brought together, the energy split, you know that all this exclusion principle and other things come and there'll be splitting of the energy level and one will be with lower energy uh, than the original one and other, other will be with higher energy and that will and there will be a 
distinct gap forbidden region where there will be no allowed in that district will be the forbidden gap and you know that this is this analysis is done in the linear combination of atomic orbital theory so we are not going into the details because of the shortage of time and you see that the superposition of this wave function psi plus there will be bonding and antibonding which will be created in the molecular orbitals which is shown in this figure and this is the sigma and pi bonding which are orthogonal to each other and uh, you have the sigma and sigma star antibonding and pi and pi star these are uh, pi star and sigma star they form antibonding and this form the bonding and from pi to pi star this is optical excitation you can have uh, so this is the structure unlike in your indirect bandgate sorry in the inorganic semiconductor we call this um, uh, conduction band and balance band as homo and lumo that we'll see sigma bonding constitutes the backbone of the organic molecules that hold the molecules together in the crystalline structure and as compared with sigma bond pi bond is significantly weaker and that that actually gives you this um, uh, hopping of this uh, carriers through organic semiconductor and the lowest electronic excitation of conjugate polymer pi pi star transition ranges from 1.5 electron volt to 3 electron volt so that that's the region where the energy band gap of semiconductors generally lie so that way they exhibit semiconducting properties and it encompasses from optical uh, application point of view visible region uh, quite well and that's that's one of the reasons that organic semiconductors are so popular for making your uh, television organic uh, using organic led oled tvs are becoming very very popular these days and uh, organic materials offer enormous flexibility for tuning of electronic properties this is the great advantage of organic material and organic molecular crystals um, are van der waal bonded uh, having weaker interaction as compared to covalent bonds in semiconductor crystal in organic semiconductors and the electronic interaction between adjacent chains is very weak and conductivity depends on conjugation length and presence of electron donating or withdrawing groups so bonding of the orbitals at lower energy than antibonding so bonding orbitals have a lower energy and antibonding have a higher energy and the former gets filled fast right means the bonding orbitals at lower energy get uh, filled fast and for multiple molecules the energy levels of orbitals give origin to energy bands as in inorganic semiconductor and the age of the valence band is called highest occupied molecular orbital homo so this is this corresponds to your valence band in the semiconductor uh, inorganic semiconductor and age of the conduction band corresponds to the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital lumo so the difference between homo and lumo is the energy band gap eg but organic materials have some more interesting properties and that enables it to emit light which which cannot be matched it's unmatched and parallel none of these inorganic materials can uh, emit so such fantastic colors which are very close to natural colors and and that's the beauty of organic materials particularly from optoelectronic application point of view emission point of view you see that in this isolated molecule on the left side you see that the discrete energy level and how it forms banded molecular crystals and there are certain excitons uh, singlet triplet excitons and there can be a uh, transition between them which can emit light so it's not solely dependent on the energy band gap but the transition between this uh, exciton transition uh, singlet triplet they give also Uh, multiple colors in organic semiconductor so this is the energy band diagram as you represent it in organic band gap semiconductor like valence band uh, uh, conduction band this is in a crystal when it is in the gas phase and this is in amorphous solid so if you compare the organic semiconductor with inorganic semiconductor the weak electronic delocalization in organic semiconductor and uh this is not weak in inorganic counterpart as you have already told you and existence of well defined spin states in organic semiconductors in the form of singlet triplet like isolated molecules leading to interesting optical properties 
and optical excitons in organic semiconductors localized in one molecule having considerable binding energy of the order of 0.5 electron volt is to be overcome. So to excite on there's a Coulombic attraction force and you have to overcome this. And for that, you need certain amount of uh, energy to dissociate them. Just not like in inorganic semiconductor, uh, electrons and holes behave like uh, free charge carriers. So the transport mode of transport in uh, organic semiconductor is also di uh, a little different from inorganic semiconductor. So one we say the band transport, other one is hopping transport. So band transport is generally observed in highly pure molecular crystal and dominant at low temperature relatively. And the mobility it exhibits is one to 10 centimeters square per volt second. And if you compare this mobility with the mobility of inorganic materials, the carrier mobility in electronic uh, inorganic materials, you find that the organic semiconductor, the mobility of the charge carrier is very, very low. One to 10 centimeter, even if you consider um, uh, your silicon, uh, the electron mobility is 1500 centimeters square per volt second. If you consider gallium arsenide, it is 8500 uh, centimeters square per volt second. So compared to that, it's one to 10. It's one of the biggest disadvantage of this organic semiconductor. So when you are thinking of high speed application and other things, the organic semiconductor may not be suitable, but there are host of other applications where you find that the organic semiconductors can play a major role. Right, and hopping transport occurs in amorphous uh, organic semiconductor solids, and the mobility is even low, 10 to the power minus 3 centimeters square per volt. So, uh, these are the reasons, and uh, I'm afraid that I'm uh, quickly running out of time. So, the mobility will depend on the degree of order and level of purity of the organic semiconductor. And mu have a value ranging from one to 10 centimeters square per volt second. And for amorphous material, it is as low as 10 to the power minus five centimeters square per volt second. But we have seen that uh, use of filler materials like nano clay, graphene oxide, etc. if you put into this uh, organic semiconductor, that can significantly uh, change the mobility. We, we did some work, fundamental work on this, and we have shown that the mobility of these materials can be tailored by adding a uh, certain amount of small amount of these uh, filler materials into this semiconductor, organic semiconductor. So these are the applications where you can see that the kind of flexibility, stretchability you get in organic semiconductors uh, is really, really not possible with rigid semiconductors. So organic semiconductor, we are looking for a better tomorrow organic materials have the potential to build devices with flexibility and stretchability. As you, as I've already told that Samsung Galaxy line, they're using OLED based smartphone and even LG and Samsung both have come with your television, which are based on organic light emitting diodes, OLED based uh, television. And smartphone companies are in the process of developing mobile handset that can be folded like a piece of paper, as I've told you. And the devices of organic materials also have potential because they can be interfaced easily with biological systems. So this is an example of an artificial human skin, which is uh, created by using uh, organic semiconductor and making an organic field effect transistor. So, this is one example, an organic semiconductor for sustainability. And your theme of this uh, webinar is on the sustainable material. Organic electronic devices will do things that silicon-based electronics cannot do. And expanding the functionality and accessibility of electronics. Organic electronic devices will be more energy efficient and eco-friendly than today's electronics. We do know that disposal of e-waste is a big challenge for all of us. And uh, having said so, I don't as, uh, mean to say that all organic semiconductors or polymers can be uh, biodegradable or they are very easy. Not that, but many of them, or by simple chemical treatment, they can be converted in a way that they uh, turn out to be biodegradable. And organic um, uh, electronic devices will be manufactured using more resource friendly and energy efficient processes than today's method. Because this technology is going to be very, very simple and 
mostly the room temperature you can uh, develop this you don't require that kind of sophistication a three five semiconductor lab needs or a silicon uh, laboratory building uh, manufacturing unit will require so much simpler technique and scalability of this is one of the important uh, factors that we can uh, scale it to a large extent i'll discuss with this but remember one thing that our goal is not to not to dethrone silicon from this but we want to make use of this material so that it can supplement even if we use the uh, silicon platform that there, there could be some additional hybrid kind of circuits which can be combined together uh, that these organic materials can be used for some sensing purpose and which can be interfaced with the human body and then subsequent thing and processing can be done with the uh, conventional um, silicon CMOS based uh, integrated circuits. So our role is not to, objective is not to dethrone silicon completely, but to supplement the functionality of silicon based uh, circuits. So we have organic LED, we have already I mentioned this, I'm not getting, going into the details of this. And uh, so these are almost all these things I've said, why this organic LED is very important because other other kind of display devices, you need some backlight, but this is backlight independent. These OLEDs generate their own light by electroluminescence. And that is one of the biggest advantage. You can save the power also. So now this organic LED is uh, having a large share of this uh, display market uh, globally. So, so that's why uh, this organic semiconductor is getting important. Another area where these organic semiconductors are largely used in uh, is you know, photovoltaic uh, devices. Large area you can develop at a moderately low cost. And some recent researches in the organic and flexible electronics was a conductive paper and that could enable future flexible electronics. This is a very, very good idea where the flexible electron proto uh, electronic prototype commonly built using polymer thin films, but the cost is high. To address this issue, scientists have turned to paper. Simple paper was used, which is renewable, biodegradable, and the cost is a fraction of the cost of uh, polymer thin films. So Bin Su and Tian and the colleagues wanted to come up with a new approach using conventional roller process that's easy to scale up. And the researcher coated paper with soft ionic gel and make it conductive. And this was sandwiched an emissive film between two layers of ionic gel paper. And when a voltage is applied, the device glowed blue, indicating electricity was being conducted. So this was the electrical durability withstanding uh, more than 5,000 cycles of bending and unbending. So you flex, deflex it, still it uh, continues to work. So it's just like a piece of paper. And the cost is $1.3 per square meter. Can you can uh, imagine? So whenever you are thinking of large area application, I, I, I think uh, organic materials will be definitely very, very attractive for such uses. And this is one example where using this ionic gel coated paper uh, used with organic film for display purposes. And another uh, thing which has been developed in recent uh, past is your semiconductor uh, decals or levels of stickers. So where you can make devices like uh, stickers will be available and you put each of the stickers and make a device. So uh, it, it's, it sounds uh, very strange, but th this is possible. So you won't have to go through this process of evaporation, deposition, or drop casting, uh, printing. You just get... Uh, you know, in uh, IC, you require a lot of, say, if you take a circuit like a mismatch circuit, metal insulator, semiconductor field of extra display, where you have the source contact, then contact, then the channel, then you have uh, insulator. So if all of them are available in the form of sticker and one can be uh, connected with the other, uh, put with the other, then you can get a complete device making use of this sticker. So this is another technology. and. Uh, this will be like uh, animal uh, skin uh, and this is the organic electronic circuit uh, which is going to uh, come this way. So this both this sticker technology and this ionic gel paper technology will revolutionize this and scaling up becomes very, very easy 
in such cases. So this is a small research contribution which we could make in the organic semiconductors uh, in our group at IIT BHU. And uh, we use the central instrumental facility at IIT BHU, the Center for Research in Microelectronics at IIT BHU, then Center for Interdisciplinary Research at MNIT Lava, and Center for Excellence in Green Energy and Sensor System at IHT Shipu, where I'm presently working. So this is one of the, I, I told you that the conductivity of these organic semiconductors can be controlled by adding some filler uh, materials like reduced graphene oxide or nanoclay. So we, we tried uh, a polycarbazole film, pure polycarbazole film, and then we doped with reduced graphene oxide, then nanoclay, then carbon nanotubes, multiple carbon nanotubes. And these are the same images of this. And the table shows that uh, the resistivity of PCJ uh, with pure PCJ, if you see it is 1.3 into 10 to the power minus 3 resistivity, conductivity is 757 uh, Siemens per centimeter. And when we go to with reduced graphene oxide, it uh, increases to 1000. And nanoclay, when we put it is 1300. So from seven to almost um, it is double. Here you find that it is exactly double when you have multi-world um, multi um, your uh, carbon nanotube CNG. So it becomes 1538 from 757. So this filler element uh, makes a huge difference in conductivity. And we had given some uh, possible explanation for how this conductivity is increasing. Uh, then we developed an organic um, uh, short key diode where we have uh, used uh, an ITU coated glass uh, as a substrate on which we deposited uh, polycarb puzzle. And this was uh, done by electrochemical uh, process. Um, deposition was done. And then we got an amorphous uh, silicon contact. And we find excellent, uh, you know, this is the setup electrochemical cell where you have a reference electrode and working electrode. And this uh, solution is there. And the substrate uh, that deposited on, sub on the substrate, this organic film was deposited. We made the measurement. Uh, and uh, these are some of the results, photoluminescent spectra and cyclic voltammetric. This diagram is also given here. And band gap is calculated by the standard method. and uh, by plotting this alpha h mu squared with h mu, and the linear portion was extended, and we got the band gap. We made the morphological studies of uh, this, and we found that initially, after putting the fillers, there's a lot of change in the morphology of this. And then we made an IV measurement, and the characteristics, we got very good characteristics, and the rectification ratio was very high. Then we, we, we tried with, uh, different contacts there we used aluminium contact and then we used different other contacts and we found that uh, these characteristics and we got a very low low dark current uh, by using this kind of structure so these are some of the results we'll not be able to discuss them much because of the shortage of time so uh, this by using tungsten as a contact we got a very very low dark current and we believe that this diode can really compete with any of the silicon diode. Uh, may not be for the switching purposes, but for other purposes. And particularly since the dark current is very, very low for detection, this kind of device would be very, very useful. And then we, this is another where we, as I've already told you, that different contacts we used and we try to optimize the structure that what kind of metal contact would give you the best uh, organic diode, okay, diode. Then we, we proposed an organic inorganic hybrid heterojunction device uh, using polycarbazole and zinc oxide because our group was involved in uh, zinc oxide test devices. So we thought that uh, let's try a hybrid heterojunction. As you know that hybrid heterojunction, we make an attempt uh, to make best use of both the worlds, that uh, the advantages of inorganic semiconductor and advantages of organic semiconductor put together. And uh, then we tried to make this device. And that device also, these uh, results were really, really very, very uh, 
uh, interesting result. And we got for JDNO PCJ, uh, which we proposed uh, and uh, demonstrated uh, showing a rectification ratio uh, 1365 at plus minus 0.7 volt. So it is much better than the contemporary devices which were uh, existing and we had we got a very good barrier height of 0.89 so that that ensures a, a very low dark current then we uh, tried a silicon based uh, heterojunction also on silicon platform we developed this uh, p type polycarbazole and uh, you, you used a platinum medium uh, contact and we got a short key dark based on that. So this is the result which we obtained. And again, if we co compare with the contemporary devices, uh, we find that uh, it exhibits a very high barrier height, low dark current, and very high rectification ratio. Then we tried a um, uh, solar cell. And this is a unique kind of solar cell where we have an ITO coated glass on which we coated polycarbazole. Uh, and then we used a, a crystalline silicon tip as the contact. Unlike in junction, we made a contact. It's a kind of point contact kind of uh, solar cell which we developed. And uh, you know that uh, the basic drawback of organic semiconductor is that it gives you uh, your uh, efficiency is generally very, very low. But when you make use of a hybrid heterojunction, uh, we achieve something more than uh, 10 percent, uh, around 12 percent uh, efficiency we, we could uh, achieve, 10.9 percent efficiency we could achieve with this uh, kind of solar cell structure. And uh, then polyendrol also we tried and made a short key diode with this. I'm not uh, getting into this, again, shortage of time. And now uh, our group has made some contribution on organic field effect transistor, OTFT. Uh, so we tried number of these devices using uh, P3HT uh, and this is the organic uh, semiconductor where you have the organic semiconductor you see on the top. This is the back gated, gate is on the back side. So you have the substrate, then uh, there's an isolated layer, right? Then you have the organic semiconductor. This is acting as the insulator and the source and drain are embedded in that. So we made an uh, OFPT structure for detection of ammonia and reported in 2012 in sensor and actuators. Uh, you see that it uh, shows the characteristics similar to your uh, MOSFET. This is the transfer characteristics and uh, source drain characteristics. And by changing the concentration of this ammonia, right, and uh, varying this uh, relative humidity, we found that uh, we can sense the presence of ammonia by varying this concentration of ammonia, the IV characteristics changes. And that's primarily because of the change of threshold voltage of this device. And we made this sensitive ammonia detector, highly sensitive. Then we made the organic thin film transistor uh, and use this as an ammonia based uh, ammonia sensor. And we made another device for uh, for detecting ammonia, aqueous ammonia, ammonia within water, which affects the aquatic life. Um, uh, so, anim aquatic animals life. So that detector also we made with the help of organic semiconductor. And here we use the new technique of uh, your F FTM technique we have used uh, here. So these are the fabrication step. Uh, Primarily, one is your uh, traditional chemical route and your spin coating technique. Uh, and uh, another new technique we have used that uh, FTM technique. We developed a MOS capacitor uh, kind of structure and we studied the CV characteristics and exposed it with uh, green light. And we find that uh, there is a significant change in the capacitance uh, in presence of green light. And uh, using that, we we can use this capacitor as a detector, uh, MOS capacitor as a uh, detector for green light. And then we use uh, PBTTT C14 film 
uh, stamped on the substrate by using FTM method. And uh, this is the structure which is given here. And based on that um, speed coating method, we developed this device. These are the transfer characteristics and current voltage characteristics, then current versus then voltage characteristics, then uh, then we studied an organic thin film transistor for ammonia sensors. As you know that uh, this is a toxic gas and uh, you need to detect. And one of the major uh, point in the study is that uh, relative humidity study and we varied the relative humidity. And we uh, found that this is a quite reliable detector. And not only that, uh, we tried to see that uh, how how good is the detection in presence of other gases also that we studied other interfering gases and we found that this uh, ammonia detectors uh, uh, work very uh, they are very very reliable and uh, selective to ammonia gas so in presence of ethane butane and other gases we we have uh, studied it and we found that it can reliably detect the presence of Ammonia. And the mechanism we explained and reported in our uh, research paper. And so, what we conclude uh, from this today's lecture is that the, even though silicon is ruling the industry, uh, in, uh, electronic industry today, this compound semiconductors was some challenge before silicon, and now these organic semiconductors are now becoming very, very attractive for flexible and stretchable devices. And new applications are likely to be in the areas of biomedicine, lab on a chip, biomedical applications, optics, of optical field, field of organic field effect transistors, OLEDs, display information technology, smart card, RFID tags, sensors for environmental monitoring. The organic electronic devices will be very promising due to chip manufacturing cost, flexibility, and easy to integrate. The biggest challenge is to develop organic complementary field effect transistor, organic field. This is a big, big challenge that most of the organic semiconductor exhibit the P type nature. And P and N type nature, if you can develop and can have a complementary, just like CMOS structure, then, then probably you can think of in future competing with silicon based MOS devices. And organic electronics, again, I, I repeat and reiterate that. The objective is not to silicon, replace silicon, but to supplement its functionality. These are some of the publications which we reported based on our uh, research work. And uh, this are some of the references uh, which I have used in my presentation. And thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for your nice presentations and uh, the introductions and the detailed discussions on the organic semiconductor materials is probability and the different type of device applications so <clears throat> quickly if you have any questions one or two questions we can take so um, now uh, our next uh, talk uh, which will be delivered by uh, professor yara so i'll introduce you uh, with professor yara our next speaker uh, professor goba uh, yara gobato so mm -hmm. he is now uh, the associate professor uh, in the Department of Physics, Federal University, uh, San Carlo in Brazil. And <clears throat> so he has done his undergraduate degree from, uh, uh, from Physics Institute of San Carlo, Brazil in 1987. And in 1989, uh, he has finished his MSc degree in Physics Institute in San Carlo, uh, Brazil, and 1993, uh, he has completed his PhD from the Department of Physics, Ecole Normal Super, Super Paris uh, uh, from France, and 1994, uh, so uh, he was in Paris in the France as a lecturer uh, in a University of the Paris. In 1995, he was postdoc in a physics institute in uh, camping brazil and in uh, 2018 uh, so he was with the uh, high field magnetic laboratory uh, in netherland uh, in 
uh, Rubant University. So his professional experience is that from 1993 to 1994, he was lecturer in the France and uh, then he, he, she was the assistant professor in the University of Federal D. Santa, Santa Katrina. And in 1997 to 2003, she was the assistant professor of University Federal D. Carlos. And in 2008, in a present, he, she, from present, uh, she is associate professor of University Federal San Carlos. So he has uh, lots, she has lots of publications in very reputed journals, uh, in physics review letters, in Journal of Applied Physics, in Physical Review B, uh, and Materials Research Bulletin, Nanoscales, as well as she has published in Applied Physics Letter. So uh, his current, he, she also run some uh, uh, big grant projects and uh, one of these project is the research project in CNPQ uh, edit, Editor Universal uh, Universal, and uh, she also run the project on 2D device for optoelectronics and uh, and etc. And now uh, she also supervised uh, uh, supervised some of the PhD students and master students and uh, with this short introduction i will uh, i will invite to professor yara to start his technical lecture ma'am please okay uh, first of all thank you very much for the opportunity for this presentation uh, which is related to uh, some uh, opportunities in to investigate 2d materials which is a recent project that I'm working on. So I, as I, I was introduced, I am from Federal University of São Carlos um, and I associate professor there and I have a team uh, in optoelectronics and magneto optics group. Okay, so this talk at the line is about uh, the opportunities I review about uh, 2D materials, uh, particularly semiconductor 2D materials. And, uh, and so the, the first uh, part of my presentation is this review uh, about the opportunities in this uh, kind of materials. And the second part is, uh, is about some works which we are uh, working here, but not of all of them because uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, projects. So I have selected two, one in large area mat uh, 2D materials because it's very important for applications. And another one with uh, um, the effect of uh, environment uh, such as uh, to use some dielectric to improve optical qualities of 2D materials. Okay, uh, so I have several projects uh, uh, in free fire semiconductor in polymers, oxides and so on. But for, uh, for uh, in the, in the a few years ago, I will focus on these 2D uh, semiconductor materials. So I have a several collaboration, uh, several people involved in these uh, works. Uh, for a large area semiconductor uh, 2D materials, I have been work with Mohamed Henini, which was in this in this uh, pre uh, presented a talk here as well, uh, University of Southampton in UK. So they uh, we have worked together for large area semiconductor materials, which is very important for application. And also we have observed some single photos for quantum computers. But uh, and I also have several collaborators in Brazil as well. But, but recently I spent one year, um, a sabbatical year in Netherlands, and I focus on uh, devices and in high fields um, for 2G, to investigate 2G materials. Particularly I have in, in been investigated gated with field effect transistors based on 2G materials. And in Moiré extons, I will explain what it is. And uh, in optical properties, uh, excitonical properties uh, of 2D semiconductor materials. And it's collaboration from University of Exeter, uh, had about University of Netherlands, and a synchrotron laboratory in Brazil in Campinas. Mm -hmm. So what what I have uh, as a facility in my lab, uh, I have a high field at up to 15 Tesla, uh, which is shown shown here. And I have several setups of for optical, several lasers, spectrometers, and also uh, we, I can perform transport measurements and combine transport measurements with optics. Those, this, is, this is the main type of measurements we can do, and even Raman, we can do some Raman here. 
and it's the basic. But when I start to work with uh, 2D materials for samples that are exfoliated, they are they are very small. So I need micro PL microscopy. So we have mounted this setup. So we you use an objective to focalize the laser on the the flake, which is around the this, the focus is around one micron, but the flake is around 20 microns. So we can do. A very nice uh, optics, and also we, can, we have another system, magnet uh, with uh, auto cube system with magnet field up to nine thousand, but is for micro PL. Okay, so uh, uh, as I, I told to you, I spent one year in Hadbout University, and they have their high fields, which is uh, it's an open facility. Everyone can apply for magnet field and can go there and do measurements. You have to write a small project and the, twice a year you can submit your project and you go there. Because there are few places in your world that we can have high fields, uh, particularly static high fields, up to 30 Tesla is really high fields. And in this lab, they combine high fields with a free electron laser. So you can, it's really a, spe a specific facility which is open access. And I spent one year, even when I was there, I, I, it was necessary to apply to high fields because it's very expensive, this kind of measurements. When you do uh, these measurements, it's a homemade magnet. You can see here the magnet is more or less here. This is me I, and a student. And you you have, uh, it's a resistive magnet, it's a bitter magnet. It's, and the, uh, the, when you have 30 Tesla, you have to apply 36,000 Ampere, so it's a really expensive, high current. So yes, a specific uh, measurements you can do there, and uh, only the the best uh, the project are selected to measure there. So just some pictures of this facility. So I uh, I have I have a lot of research uh, in Brazil. Uh, Explain that I have this infrastructure of, of fields, that I have micro PL, uh, and. Um, uh, can you see in high fields? We can apply for high fields, and, and I was showing how is this high field magnet. So you, it's is is a homemade system. And it's a European laboratory where you can apply. They pay for the measurement. The measurement is very expensive. One year, one week of measurements is about six thousand euros. is very expensive. And, but uh, for the best project they can pay, and and it's you you have a basic it's a P, a PL setup uh, where we can share laser uh, and uh, focalize on the sample and collect the emission, in and you can apply high fields. So I will leave it like this because I, I have the impression when I go uh, uh, the spring uh, I cannot see it not working. So what uh, are these two G materials? These wonderful um, um, crystals, which has wonderful interaction and in between the planes, so you can exfoliate it easily, and you can have mono layers. And there are different kinds of two G materials with different properties. Uh, they can be superconductor, uh, uh, semiconductor, metal. And and uh, different uh, properties. So we are interested in semiconductor materials, and particularly this this kind of materials, transi transitional metal dicoccoide materials, because when you have monolayers, they are uh, direct gap semiconductor materials, and they have emission uh, from a yellow region to near infrared region, and they have very nice properties as well as I will explain in the next slides. So as I mentioned, you can exfoliate easily these materials and you can combine uh, materials with different prepares. So you, ha you have a unique uh, opportunity to make devices and uh, head structures with unique prepares. And uh, you can uh, put one uh, on the other, on the, but you can turn the layer so you can have an angle between layers. And you can create artificial potential, which is named uh, Moiré pattern, which is very nice because it changed a lot of properties. I, I think you are, are aware that if you, ha you have graphene, for example, if you put a, a specific angle, you can have a superconductivity. So you can uh, modify uh, optical and transport properties of this 2D material just by changing this angle because it created this Moiré super lattice. And you can make devices with uh, really um, new prepared and for the next generation of optoelectron devices and sensors and cells, solar cells, laser and so on. So in my side, I mean, I, I do a little bit of application, but I'm very interested in fundamental physics. So this presentation has a lot of fundamental physics, but this is a 
important to 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 create new devices as well so what's the motivation the main motivate for uh, so one motivate is exit on uh, physics uh, because of the binding like like uh, in in organic semiconductor uh, 2d materials has high binding energy for excitons and but you have also valley physics which i i will be uh, I'll explain later and uh, we have this uh, you can play with this, this moire pattern to change properties of of, of uh, extons and uh, transport properties and very recent people are very interested in magnetism 2d magnetism yeah, and you can have a new generation of spintronics devices using 2d materials um, um can you hear me so just to check if it's working is it working it is working ma'am it is working. okay sorry sorry so just to check because i never know i cannot see you so okay so <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, yes i'm still alone so i'm not sure but, and so uh, you can also play uh, uh, combined with you know, have ferro electricity in 2d uh, and for fundamental physics you can have both eyes condensation at high temperature as compared to atomic physics uh, uh, it's a nice kind of system to understand superconductivity and it also for the next generation of optoelectronic devices. So what is this 2D materials? And uh, so usually this dicoconjunite semiconductor materials, they have a hexagonal crystal structure. Uh, we are interested in monolayer because it's direct gap semiconductor materials and they have a strong spin warped coupling and they have this lack of inversion symmetry when they are monolayer. They can recover in few layers, but for monolayer, they have these properties. And these properties have important impact uh, on the bond structure of this material. So, um, uh, bond structure, well, as I mentioned, if you have bulk or few layers, they are not interesting for me because they are indirect get semiconductor material. But if they are monolayer, you have a, a, a sharp transition for direct gap semiconductor material. And so if you measure emission uh, for monolayer, it's very strong. And if you go to few layers, it, we have very low efficient emission. So we are interested in this monolayer. Um, and um, there are several ways to prepare the sample. So uh, in my case, we have, I have a, a lot of works related to exfoliation. We can exfoliate. You can transfer and put one layer on another layer. This is just a picture for exfoliation and to, uh, for transfer. Sorry, for exfoliation, you use a special tape. And so you put the same and on the, you buy a crystal. And so you put on and remove layers and you put on silicon oxide substrate. So this is the picture uh, from uh, a microscope. So you can see very transparent uh, layers with a monolayer, bilayer, and so on. And you can uh, calibrate and measure the number of layers. And for transfer, use a polymer uh, with these two D materials. So you put one together by using a microscope. So it's easy to do, but of course there are some detail to have high quality uh, samples. Um, but for application is a is a problem because uh, you do this um, um, manually. You cannot uh, use this for for a device to sell. So it for application is very important to develop uh, growth of 2D materials, and it's very challenging. It's not easy to have high quality semiconductor materials. One uh, very common technique is CVD. So you can grow. You have some triangles if you are crystalline, and the sizes are around two. Uh, 200 micron, but uh, there are there are other way we can grow by van der Waal epitaxy, which is um, you can grow large area semiconductor 2D materials, which is very important for application to and and, and to control the the properties. But of course, for fundamental physics, I don't know if you are aware, uh, these growth techniques cannot give you very high quality. Um, but uh, people are are working on development to improve the quality of this. For high quality the exfoliation uh, is better for optics. I mean, so how do do you determine the thickness of this uh, material? You you can go to a microscope, optical microscope, and you can calibrate the optical microscope, and you can see when you have monolayer and bilayer, and you can use uh, combined with AFM where you measure the thickness. You can also use a Raman because they, there are specific Raman modes and depend on the separation of Raman modes and the relative intensity and the laser use, you can you can have information if you have a monolayer, bilayer and so on. 
And if you have an initial setup uh, for, for photoluminescence, uh, it's very easy because monolayer is strong emission and few layers are very low emission. The position also giving some insight if you have monolayer, bilayer, three layer, and so on. And it, this is very usual technique for 2G materials. You can also have uh, measurements of reflectance. Um, you measure the reflectivity in, on, the, on the flake and on the substrate. You, 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 you you take the difference, you have information of absorption. So usually we combine emission with reflectivity because you have information of absorption and emission and can understand much better things. Just some example here with reflectivity and absorption, you can measure transition, fundamental transition and excite transition by using reflectivity. For PL, you mainly measure the fundamental transition. Okay. So, uh, but there are some problems or some opportunities. I, I cannot say problems because uh, when you put this flake on a substrate, uh, the way you put the flake, you can create some strain. And uh, here it's just an example, but it's not uh, an intentional strain. You, you, they put a, a flake on a polymer, we can have some deformation. And when you have this deformation, this strain, you change the, the band structure. So you can have, uh, um, if you, you have this kind of strand, you can have a, a red shift of emission, and you can even have transition from direct band gap to indirect band gap, and so on. For example, if you have a bilayer, which is indirect band gap, if you apply strain, you can have a direct band gap. So you can really plan some devices by taking account of these strain effects. So we, we call this a straight tonics. So there are people that only work with strain at changes of purports to 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 you to, to make devices for example another problem you can have when you put this flake on a substrate you can have charge transfer for example if you put on silicon sites so you can dope a lot but you can isolate by using some isolator which can be another 2g material as i'm going to explain so as I mentioned to you, we have very nice uh, laboratory for uh, excitonic physics because you have this 2G confinement and, and uh, you have a high uh, uh, um, effective mass and redux dialectic screening. So uh, the bind energy is very important, are around 500 milli electron volts. Uh, and, and the trial, you can have a different kind of uh, excitonic complex because if you have excess or you have doping you can create a, a lot of uh, excitonic complexes and the binding energy is very high as compared for example as compared to free five semiconductor material really much uh, higher and you can do a lot of interest in physics and explore these prepared for devices as well so uh, uh, what about this excitonic complex we, we have different kinds as mentioned so if you have electron and hole they are bind by Coulomb interaction. You have extons. If you have an excess of carriers, you have three particles, two electrons and one hole, or two holes and one electron. You have this trion, and uh, and the energy of emission of trion is different from exciton, so a different peak. And you can also have by exciton charged by exciton, and the binding energy is very high, so you can explore this physics and these properties. So uh, usually you make devices. Uh, he, uh, so you can put in a holder with no objectives. Here I have a, an example of devices. This is a picture of devices. So we have a monolayer and electrical contacts, and you can use an objective which can go in, in low temperature, uh, and uh, you can control this um, excitonic complex by applying. Uh, if you make a field effect transistor, if you apply gate you change electrically uh, the doping. So you can play and control the doping and investigate uh, excitonic optical properties of this monolayer uh, TMD. Okay, so when you, you apply gate, uh, you have uh, this device, uh, you apply gate. Uh, so depending on the voltage, you can have P-doped or any doped material. And it, so you can control electrically the doping. And uh, this is for MUSA2, uh, but for different 2D materials is very rich physics. For example, for monolayer WSE2, we depend on the, this is a color code map for PL. So you can see that if you change the gate, you change the doping, and you can observe different kinds of emissions. So you can have the exton, by exton, 
different kind of triumphs, and there is another one that I, I'm going to explain, dark uh, exons, and, and a lot of really rich physics, uh, really nice physics, but you, ha you have to, to control and you have to, to, to make a field effect transistor and to control the, this uh, exciton property. So you combine something applied both by using the, the advantage to make some uh, fundamental physics. And uh, what about volley trunks? Uh, as I mentioned to you, the, the, the crystal structure is hexagonal, and the first brilliant zone is an hexagonal. And the, the direct gap, dif different from free 5 semiconductor materials, the direct gap is in the center of first brilliant zone. But for 2G, the, the direct gap is on the corner of this hexagonal. So you have direct gap here. Although they are um, symmetric, they, they are not equivalent. Uh, as you have a strong uh, spin orb coupling, the, the conduction band uh, and the valence band are separate in terms of spin. And the select some roads involve circular polarized light. And they are um, they have the same gap in this corner and in this corner, but they are not equivalent in terms of the spins. So you can select one valley we call valley you know, and another valley by just using circular polarized light sigma plus uh, and sigma minus and right and left uh, circular polarized light so and uh, for this this is what we say valley trunks we can play with valleys in this kind of materials and this in these valleys uh, they have different the same uh, gap but they are not equivalent so uh, um, but it, uh, the physics is not so easy. We, you have this transition metal dicocosinite materials, and they are similar in bond structure, but there are some difference. For example, if you are dealing with MO, monolayer of MOS E2, the fundamental transition uh, is the spin allowed, because for the transition, uh, you have to conserve spin, so it, it's, it's okay. But for dark materials, uh, the fundamental transition, you can see that it's up here, the spin and down. So it's not allowed because you have to change the spin. So it's, it's spin forbidden. And uh, this for the fundamental transition. So it, this material I call dark material, but they are very interesting because you can write these dark axons and they have long decay times and they are very interesting. Okay, so... Um, Concerned to this spin forbidden dark axons, uh, you can write uh, by using different configurations. For example, it's time to measure like this. And you have the flake here and the objective here. They are not for, uh, allowed because it's spin forbidden. But if you have a, a different polarization configuration, you can observe them. Another way to observe this is dark axons is if you apply parallel magnetic field. If you apply parallel magnetic field, you mix the spin components and you can write these dark axons. And people are very interested in this dark because these dark are promising system to, 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 to a lot of physics uh, such as um, uh, Bose-Einstein condensations. And so just to show you in this configuration of polarization, uh, if, you, if the polarization is in Z, so you can observe this dark, she's XD is dark. But if you have another, the, the objective is here for this polarization, you cannot observe them. So it's one way, one way to observe dark uh, axons in monolayer WS2. Another way, as I explained, if you apply parallel magnet field, you mix these spin components. So if as in, I have here the color code map for photoluminescence. So as you increase the magnet field and the dark is um, brighter, so you can use uh, this parallel component uh, to, to, to observe these dark axons. And the, the, the PL decay of this dark axon is very long, so it's mm, interesting for application as compared to bright, bright trion, bright axons, which have very uh, uh, fast PL decay. Okay. Um, what about, as I'm, I mean, I work a lot of magnetic field, so what happens when you apply perpendicular magnetic field? If you apply perpendicular ma magnetic field, we have this, what, what you call valleysim splitting. What is this? Uh, as I mentioned, these two valleys, K and K prime, they are degenerated. They are not equivalent in terms of spin. This is zero Tesla. They have the same gap in different valleys. They are only different in terms of spin of the bands. 
But if you apply perpendicular magnetic field, you break this degenerescence and you, for one valley, the gap is lower, for another valley, the gap is higher. And this difference of energy of uh, emissions from the both uh, valleys, uh, this difference of emissions, uh, or difference of energy, uh, and it's proportional to magnetic field. So it's linear. As you increase magnetic field, this separation, this difference of separation is going to increase. But it's proportional to what we say valley G factors. And a lot of people were interested in people that work with high fields to extract G factors of these two G materials for axons, trions, by axons, and so on. So a lot of research in the last three years. And, uh, and another thing that is very important for devices, for example, is to make heterostructures. So you can combine uh, different uh, 2D materials. We can combine transition metal, dicocogenite materials, but you can also combine with uh, uh, other properties. So what is interesting, because you have a fast, uh, for example, if you use MOS2 and WS2, when you put together, we have a band offset and we have transfer of carriers from one layer to another layer in the conduction band and from one, one layer to another layer in the, conduct, in the valence band. And you can observe this uh, interlayer axon, so one electron in one layer, and another electron in another layer, which is really interesting because they have long decay times, and you can play with uh, Moiré pattern. There are a lot of things to do. For example, if you change, and usually these interlayer axons are observed for uh, near uh, zero, uh, the angle zero between layers and 60. But if you play uh, the, with the, the angles, we have in other physics, other effects on these two interlayer axons. One interesting system is uh, when you have um, a degenerated uh, conduction band, for example, if you use MOS E2 and WS E2, the conduction band is degenerated, so you can have hybridization of X. And this, this, um, this, um, uh, this kind of head strokes is very interesting because you have you can enhance this uh, moiré effect. So it, it can generate it. We have this uh, pattern uh, generated moiré axon. So you can observe different axons, and this can be observed if you make reflectivity. So you have here the PL uh, in red, and in green you have reflectivity. You have several uh, peaks which are related to these moiré axons, which are related to the, this angle between the layers. So this is really nice. This, this work was published recently in Nature because there are a lot of in, in, in fundamental phys physics behind for these 2D materials. As I mentioned, it's very important as well to investigate uh, magnetic properties uh, and these 2D magnets. So it's interesting physics because you have a monolayer, you have ferromagnetism. If you have a bilayer, you can have antiferromagnetism. So you can play with layers, you can play with uh, stack angles, you can play with gates, you can play if strain, uh, and you can change uh, magnet properties for application in spintronics. And uh, if to measure the magnetism, you usually use uh, the MOOC technique, where you measure the change of uh, linear polarized polarization of light when uh, they interact with uh, 2D magnets, or you can do Raman as well. So a lot of physics now in this just last two years a lot of papers in nature communication in several high impact journals about uh, magnet properties of 2g materials so here just an example of nature physics and we they measure roma and they can evidence magnets 2g magnets in this uh, uh, with uh, spin with uh, in 2g materials so uh, another uh, interest effect is that when you put together a non-magnetic material with a magnet material, we can uh, transfer properties to another layer. So you, uh, because we have this magnet proximity effect. So one material that's not magnet, if you put close to a magnet, they can be magnet. So people are playing with these properties, but I will not have time to go in detail in the physics. So um, I will escape here uh, for another uh, area which is very interesting. People are in important investment for quantum computers. And uh, in 2D materials, we can have these single photons, which are generated by defects. Uh, for example, you have a vacancy, and this is an insulator, uh, hexagonal boron nitride, uh, which is called HBN. So they have some vacancy, so we can create by using electron beam, for example, or ion beam, and you can have this sharp emission. 
which you can prove that you can measure this photocorrelate function, can prove that are single photons, and that you can observe these single photons even at higher temperatures. You can observe this in HBN, but you can also observe in uh, TMDC, sub, such as WS2. We have uh, one project uh, in this area, but I will not have time to explain. And uh, you can play with strain and with defects, and, and you can, uh, local strain, you can deform, have some deformation of band structure, and you can have a defect, you can localize the axon, and you can have this sharp emission, which are single fault, which are very uh, promising system for uh, quantum computers and to integrate with uh, photonic devices and uh, and so on. So a lot of people work on it. So so just an example when you can integrate for you. We have a waveguide here. You can plot a 2D material and you can integrate this single photon emission from 2D materials. So it's a lot of work uh, which is starting here. But I know you not have time. I have to print something in my lab. So I have two uh, works that I would like to to show to you. One work is about uh, large area and uh, monolayer WS2. And another works about because um, to improve the optical quality of this monolayer, people use this HBN, uh, it's uh, encapsulate HBN to improve the optical quality, but it's very, very expensive. So you, you propose here locals dielectric to improve optical properties of WS2. So for large area materials, so we can grow very big one at the size uh, and this work and uh, this growth uh, are, are made in Southampton University in UK. So you can have here the, the, the picture and the optic image is very um, homogeneous and even the SEM image. And you can have a, a good quality for PL and Rama. Uh, and we have investigated uh, with our collaborators. Uh, and even for for growth, it's very good quality. And we can observe exon triangles and by exon. But there's a, there was a problem uh, which motivates us to do more research. The problem is when you use a laser power, you have photodoping. So so, so the the you you the the, the uh, sorry, I uh, will show this slide. So as uh, this is measurements of photonics with time. You can see that the, the relative intensity of emission peaks are changed with time. And the reason is photon doping because you have on the on the on the surface uh, and the, in the interface on the interface of a silicon oxide and monolayer, we have adsorbed molecules and when you use a laser, you can remove and you can dope. And so you, have, you can have photon doping. So, uh, so it's interesting to investigate, and uh, you cannot recover if it's low temperature. You in dope, dope. You can only recover if you heat the sample again, and you can investigate in different position. And uh, we have this photo doping with time. This is time and color code more map of PL. But you have these sharp peaks, which are excombined by defect and impurity or vacancy, which are. Um, um, promising system for single photos, but there is a problem because they are blinking. So you can, see, with time, you, you see disappear and see and so on. So, but but there there are some ways to to improve these uh, single photos, and this we are working on, but we don't have time to show you. So, to, in order to solve these problems, we can improve the optical properties of the, the same material WS2 by using, for example, uh, encapsulated samples HBN, which is a uh, isolator 2D materials with high gap around six electron volts. And it's very flat system. It's very flat, it's like a two mirror in below and up. And it is, if you compare uh, samples on silicon oxide, the photoluminescence is very broad. But if you, you, you cap it with HBN, we have sharp emission, very qu high quality. But the, the problem is these this HBN are very expensive and you need a high quality. So we have proposed an alternative um, uh, material. It's talc. It's talc that you use for babies. But we have in Brazil a lot of uh, talc crystals. And in several places in the world, we have talc. Right? It's uh, the stone. It's a natural stone. And uh, we make, can make. Uh, it's a soup stone. You can make, uh, of course, in a nice things. But you can use for physics, for devices, and so on. So it's a, a layer oxide. It's a 2D oxide. And you can exfoliate it, the, the oxide, and and they they have high band gap. They are very flat, 
and they are very they have the dialectic content very similar to HBM. So we have tried to use this uh, talk to uh, isolate the monolayer from silicon side to improve. So the first uh, work. Um, so uh, just to show you, and you can exfoliate. So this is a, mon a few layers of talk on silicon oxide. So you can see that's very transparent in a microscope. And you can measure AEFM to see if it's flat. It's really flat and comparable uh, to HBN. Very similar uh, flatness uh, of HBN and talk materials. So the first idea to use talk to improve uh, devices, for example, was used for another group in Brazil, in Minas Gerais. They have used talk to isolate graphene from silicon oxide and they have obtained very nice results. They have published in two G materials journal and they, they show that this natural talk uh, can dope uh, graphene with P type too, and it can increase the mobility. So it's really nice results, but it was only uh, devices. So in our group, we have a lot of experience with optics. So we decided uh, I had a contact from this group that came to, to the state of Sao Paulo and it's, it's in, at Syncroto Laboratory. So uh, it's a lady um, and she we decided to, to, to try to use talk for TMD uh, for semiconductor materials. And so we, we were aware that it was successful for graphene. So we decided to use for TMD. So we, we did two, two things. One, just to put uh, the, the monolayer on a top with a thickness of around 100 nanometers. And another thing is to make devices. These devices were made in, in Exeter. It's the, there is a graphene center in Exeter. I had a collaborator and I, I had a student there. So they make devices. They yeah, were very successful. They just published in any scale. And I, I was signed this paper because part of the, the, the work I made in optics. So uh, we have this non-scale and more recent uh, we have um, uh, investigate magneto PL from the samples and we, and we have publishing in physical review applied. So let's see, let's show you a, a little bit about optics, not for devices because I don't have time. So they are very stable. I don't have this, this photo doping. Uh, I have a high, a very bright emission. And when they go to low temperature, this, is, this was uh, room temperature, when you go low temperature, we, we can observe several sharp peaks. And if you compare this emission from HBN encapsulate samples, they are very comparable, really good, much better than HBN. Of course, there are some details to prepare samples. So uh, in order to investigate and compare with HBN samples, we have performed PL measurements and magnet PL measurements in high fields for this sample. So I, I just have a picture, uh, uh, AF measurements to, to measure the thickness and just typical emission from this uh, WS2 on talk and laser power measurements. The laser power measurements are usually uh, performed to, to have information about the nature of these different emission peaks. So uh, you can pro map the, this emission and you can go to high fields. So that's I was there in a sabbatical year in Netherlands. I applied a project and I was successful to measure uh, photoluminescence in high fields up to 30 Tesla. So it is the measurements for uh, sigma plus circular polar right uh, circular polarized light and left circular polarized light. Uh, and we can analyze this data and we can extract this. Uh, we have the Zima split, so the, we have this opening for sigma plus and sigma minus emission from different valleys. We can uh, calculate the splitting as function of magnetic field. We can extract these G factors that I have explained to you in the uh, slides. And you can also measure the, the polarization of the valley. So we, we have investigated. I will not go in detail for the physics because the time is going on. But you can uh, have different behavior for axons, different kind of trions by axon and dark trions. These dark trions is really challenging to observe in this kind of materials. There is only one, another paper which is, was published in letter that, that came they could observe uh, dark trions in WS2. But to observe dark trions in WS2, in this nanoletters paper, they had to apply tilted magnetic field. In my case, I have only perpendicular magnetic field, and I can observe this dark trion. 
Um, and by by analyzing this the sign of this the polarization of that triangle, I can say to you if I have uh, n doped or p doped, what is the problem of doping? Because this uh, is a natural crystal, and they have some impurity, uh, which is iron and aluminium, and they are uh, ac acceptors, so they can uh, uh, use the the electrons from one layer, and so they can result in p doped material. What and this was happened for um, graphene. But in our case, the analysis, which I will not have time to explain, uh, uh, this positive uh, polarization proved to me that uh, I have an any dope sample. And I can combine, of course, with electrical measurements. So in case of WS2, this, these impurities uh, are not important for us. The doping is very small. Of course, it can dope a little bit, but uh, it keep the natural dope, the, the natural dope of WS2 is n doped and it keep the n doped when you stop, similar to HBM. So it's really a fantastic result for application. So I, always, I have some explanation for why uh, that sign can give insights about the doping. It's because uh, when you have man, minority uh, holes or minority electrons, the polarization is different because the occupation of the valley is different. So I, of course, I need time to explain, but it's more or less this idea. Uh, it depends the minority carry, and it depends uh, we, uh, if you have a fast transfer from one valley to another valley to, to know the sign of polarization. And if you measure, if it's positive, it's any dope, the polarization. If it's negative, it's p dope. So it's one way to use optics to have information about doping. And uh, I, I, this uh, polarization, we have inversion of sign, but this inversion of sign is, is about physics, uh, which means that the fundamental, uh, uh, the lower energy, uh, the higher energy emission is uh, more intense, but this uh, I will not have time to explain, it's related to to the, the, um, the levels of biaxon, the transitions, and the occupation of levels, which can explain this physics. So another thing that you can observe is funnel replicas of uh, um, of uh, dark axons, and you can even even for this very simple talk crystal natural, you can you can, you can have a lot of rich physics. So it could evidence these funnel replicas of dark axons, trions, which was only only observed in one paper of HBN encapsulated semi. So we can have a really rich physics, but but uh, not only for physics. In this paper of nanoscale, you show that devices are really uh, good if you use talk to isolate from uh, silicon oxide. So we have compared our, our results with uh, these uh, nanoletter papers for G factors, and we have a very similar results. So talk does not modify the uh, properties of WS2. And uh, so uh, to finalize uh, my conclusion, we have really nice opportunities to investigate and to create new uh, devices um, by using uh, magnetic properties, fel electricity, and proximity effects, and to control doping um, electrically by using um, devices. And not, not only for fundamental physics, what is in the main uh, presentation of my talk, but also for uh, uh, applications. So we have um, investigated some uh, devices and some, uh, some, some samples, but then I, I, of course I show only a few uh, works that we have performed, and it's very successful and published in non-scale, physical review applied, and so on. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. It's uh, just an overview of uh, works we performed. Of course, we are open for any collaboration with hybrid two systems, uh, with, with 2D materials and device. So you are welcome to collaborations and so on. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, ma'am, for your nice talk and uh, the very good introductions and the detailed discussions on the 2D materials and is micro PL system and the micro level system explanation. Uh, thank you, madam. So we can quickly take two, three questions uh, if uh, you have in your mind. Uh, so, Professor Tamib or anything, uh, anyone else, uh, you have any questions to uh, Professor Yara? Uh, 
please. Yeah, I see a lot of information. Yeah. Good, yes. good evening. Good morning. Yeah, a lot of information. Yeah, I'm a lot of yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, I wonder. Uh, uh, did you see uh, some photoconductivity in, in the um, uh, molybdenum so disulfide molybdenum, something similar like uh, graphene-like two uh, D materials? Is it possible yes, to measure? It's, it's, for the conductivity. Yes, because yes, it's possible because we have uh, all because before I, I was used to work with uh, uh, resonant diodes and transport measurements and I can combine photoconductivity uh -huh. and transport because we have uh, uh, our infrastructure to mm -hmm. to because we measure gated samples so it's possible if you are interested uh -huh. in, in measurements because we have uh, several lasers and lamps we can control the the, the energy of axons and measure photoconductivity as well. Ah, yeah. My, my question is uh, deal uh, with uh, one information that it uh, very poor, uh, very low for the conductivity in graphene, gra in graphene flake. That's mm -hmm. why I ask what is, is it, is it mm, measurable or to detect some uh, ah, because, uh, because Graphene is a semi-metal, no? that's like the point yeah, yeah. I think. Yes, uh -huh. yeah. as I'm dealing with semiconductors, so the photoconductivity is important, so you can have, but but I'm not used to measure, but it's possible. Uh -huh. just, I, ah, it's possible. I never but, measure. I see. Yes, it's possible. I see. Yes. I see, I see. Thank you, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your question. Sorry, if yeah. it's a lot of physics, a lot of, I could not explain yeah. the detail, but in the time. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yes. yeah. it's too yeah. much. Yeah, yes. I, I, I guess uh, the students are <laughs> very tired after the like, Yes, yes, the too much information, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you, ma'am. And any other questions, please, from the participant, students? Any other questions? Sir, uh, good evening, sir. Sir, my name is Ankita Bibarta. So I have a question. So uh, can I ask, ma'am? Yes, yes sure, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, uh, you discussed about the molybdenum sulfide and uh, it's uh, pro like sensing properties. So did you do any type of gas sensing in uh, using this material? Uh, no, but I know people use this uh, field effect transition for gas sensing, but but I'm not use. Uh, I, I don't have the system for gas sensing, uh, so I just play with optics. Uh, you, but it's, uh, there are uh, people that do this. It's possible. They they use for gas sensing and also for biologic sensing. So because any uh, anything that is on the the surface can change the the properties of the material. So for sense, people use a field effect or transition usually, but you can also have change of emission prepared. Uh, but it's not my area. I don't work with sense, but people, there are a lot of people that work with sensing in using field effect transistor. Yes, yes. Okay. 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 Good. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you, ma'am, uh, for your uh, presentations and giving us the time in this uh, webinar and though it is not physical uh, but next time uh, <clears throat> we must uh, prepare some physical uh, conference international conference uh, i must expect you here also in yes. india <laughs> i think my presentation was different because the others were more applied but uh, <laughs> it's a, it was a different way uh, okay different words, uh, yes. uh, professor can I make the one uh, like the questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure, 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 sure. Okay. Sure. I'm Muhammad. I, I'm Sohel from Japan. Actually, uh, thank you very much for your outstanding presentation and lots of physics there. And you, you did really the outstanding um, <coughs> experiment that you already did. But one more, can you please explain a little bit the basic information related to the 2D material? Uh, actually, the, I am focusing mainly for 2D for uh photovoltaic photovoltaic application mm -hmm. so recently actually the like the new trend to use the 2d material mixed with the 3d three-dimensional perovskite 2d 2d perovskite with the three-dimensional perovskite and then uh, that like the improve rapidly improve the uh, particularly stability so 
can you please uh, like the you mean the, some... the stability the stability of periscope yes yes uh, usually the, like ah, the I, I i think i have seen a, a work because the uh, they they use encapsulate a periscope yeah, yeah 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 definitely yes yes, yes. that yes. look like the interfacial engineering very thin layer it's similar what i have shown you can use talk for example you can use hbn for periscope to improve this this degradation so in that case uh, related to that question actually the do you have any comments related what type of characteristics like the should have the 2d materials uh that can give like the higher photovoltaic performance as well i, I think for perovskite per it's, it's time i don't i have seen i'm not uh, um, i don't have a, a lot of experience but i i, I have seen more one work they have used hpn but it's very expensive we don't have application for expense mm. maybe one tip is to use talk i i have a lot of crystal it's very cheap because you can, uh, if you need, I can send to you, and you could try to encapsulate with uh, yeah, talk because yeah, yeah. it's very cheap material, uh, and it, it's used for, uh, I think, for applications. It's not cheap because there is this this talk material. This, there is a few works, and uh, it is very successful to use this. Then this material. The recent actually, the, I am thinking about the two D material, so that can be incorporated in previous type of solar cells. It means the on top of Top of two D top of three D material that we can uh, like the drop the some two D materials the, yes. that can further improve the stability. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much. So for you, I think you can have my email if you want. Yeah, to sure, sure, try. sure. I can send you. I can. Uh, you can send me. We can put together. We can play with. Yeah, sure. I, I have some some experience with photonics in perovskite, and I had this bad experience that the, the PL changed uh, because it was some degradation. No, no, yeah, it's, the, 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 I'm not aware that people use the, polar to create the optimized condition. It takes time, actually. Like, actually, yes, it takes time. Yes, uh, yes. Definitely, uh, like the, I'm very much pleased to see your presentation. Really, you did the excellent. Uh, please keep contact. Hopefully, though, we may have uh, some good collaboration in your future. You know, I mean, uh, you are welcome. I'm, I'm, I'm interested to do different things, uh, to collaborate, and so everyone can write me. We can discuss. I'm sorry, sorry. Though it's not the related to your field, so but but uh, but overall that you are working with the 2D materials. Based on these key point, actually, I was asking the some like the very basic thing for uh, the 2D materials. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for your question and comments. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, uh, Anurudh, Dr. Aniruddha. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, sure. So uh, what?